right. So, so first, let's just um, first. And we will make um, we will make uh, the materials available to you. I will make the performance test available to you as a Word document, so that you can highlight it. Um, you, so that you can highlight it. I can probably put some of the um, old California PTs, um, not old ones, but all the ninety minute ones, as a Word document up for you all as as well, so that you can practice with it. So you can use the highlighting feature. Um, so okay. So today, so the goals for today is through dissecting the performance test from October. Through dissecting it, we want you to understand how the bar examiners write a performance test. How do they write it? How, and then also how do you structure your performance test? How do you structure it? What's the proper structure? They all of the performance tests essentially have follow the same format for the most part. Sometimes they'll stray a little bit, but not a whole lot. Essentially, a performance test is a performance test is a performance test. They're mostly going to require, they pretty much all require the same skills. Um, they pretty much all require the same skills. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and Jaquisha asked if you'll be able to highlight on the actual PT. If you're taking it in California, yes, you can absolutely highlight on the performance test. I believe on the UBE, you'll be able to. Some jurisdictions do things a little bit differently. Um, and I will be, I will talk about everything I'm doing tonight is geared towards taking the performance test remotely taking the performance test remotely, doing it without scratch paper, what it looks like on the screen. I am going to practice with the documents side by side because it's much easier for you as the viewers to see it and for me to teach it that way. But I'm gonna show you when you actually take the test, it'll be top split screen, top and bottom. So I'll show you what that looks like. Um, I'll show you what that looks like as well. Um, and yes, I can make the document a bit bigger. Is that okay, Stacy? Very good. Everybody can see that okay. All right, good. Um, so, so understand really how to structure your performance test, um, and also how to you know how do you do this thing without scratch paper, and how do you use the tools that are available to you? I do heavily rely on the highlighting, um, highlighting and using different colors to do so, which is why I we're going to make the PT available to you as a Word document. For me personally, I have a hard time changing the color. Um, I have a hard time um, changing the color when I'm highlighting on Adobe. Um, so I like to make it available in Word so it's easier for you all. July, I don't think will be done in person. Um, July, I don't think it'll be done in person. And even though in California, um, and then the UBE has already said that, that they're making, um, or the NCBE, which, writes the, UB, the um, UBE, they have already said that there's gonna be a, a remote option for July. Um, and so, and I think California is gonna follow suit as well. I don't even know if we'll be in person by next February, uh, February, 2022. Um, the Cal Bar does allow some paper. They do allow you some paper. I just don't think you actually need it. Really the most beneficial thing is when you can actually mark up the performance test is when you can actually do that. So. Um, all right. Um, and then the, this particular video and all of the materials will be posted in, I have, where we have, we created, um, on the website where we have like all of our normal courses that are paid. We are making a free course that's available that will have this video. Uh, this video will be posted there. Our prior videos will be posted there. Um, materials for the prior, um, performance tests that are posted on YouTube. Um, and then also um, you know, every, everything for this one, all of the materials, the answer, the documents that I'm going over right now. So, um, all right, uh, let's see, okay. Um, all right, so, and uh, Manfred also posted, um, he posted the link in the chat for everybody right now too. Manfred is, uh, works for me. Um, and he's one of my, uh, he's a student, a former student of mine at, uh, where I teach at the undergraduate school. Um, and he's an amazing assistant and helps out in a million different ways. So um, he, he will help, you know, with any administrative um, things uh, that we need. All right, so let's actually get into it. And I'm gonna, um, I will, we'll be monitoring the questions, but I'm gonna try to go through it. If there's anything urgent, you know, um, feel free to type it in, but I'm gonna try to pause to look at questions. So I'll go back and forth. Um, 
All right, so those are goals for today. Understand how the bar examiners write the performance test. Understand how to structure your performance test and understand how to complete the performance test without scratch paper, without scratch paper. You can use it, you can do it with scratch paper as well. You can absolutely do that. However, I don't think it's totally necessary. And given the time crunch uh, in a performance test, I think um, if you can do it without uh, relying on the scratch paper, I think that that is beneficial. I think that that is very beneficial. Um, so, okay. Um, all right. Oh, and it looks like a lot. I've just got a whole lot of emails. So it looks like a lot of you um, are enrolling in that class. So thanks. All right. So this is the process for doing a PT and doing it remotely. This is the process uh, for doing the PT and, and doing it remotely. And you'll want to follow this um, to the T, really to the T. And I'm gonna walk you through the whole process today. I'm gonna walk you through the whole process today. I'm not gonna write every bit of it out. I'm not gonna do the complete analysis, um, but we will walk through this entire process um, I've also given you notes on about how long each step should take you so that you can hopefully when you practice, when you go from here and then you practice all of the other California PTs or the UBE PTs, the MPTs, um, you should be following this general timeline. So first thing you do, the first thing you do is you review the task memo. That's the very first thing you do. That's the document that tells you what you are supposed to be doing. It gives you your task. They give you a little bit of info about your client and then they tell you what the task is. So the first thing you do is you review the task memo and you wanna read it very intently. Um, you, wanna, you wanna pay attention to a few things. One, one, you wanna know who's your client, who's your client, um, what you are to do, what product you are going to prepare. Is it a memo? Is it a brief, et cetera? You wanna really pay attention to the facts that are stated in the task memo. The facts that are stated in the task memo are critically important. They are critically important um, and they, uh, you're gonna want to use all of those facts when you're actually writing your answer. So pay attention to those. So be very in the zone when you're reading that task memo because it's critically important. When you're reading it, I generally say, and this is true for essays as well, but I generally say, read it out loud in your head. So read it in the same way that you would read um, something out loud, giving, giving effect to all of the punctuation. Um, but so read it out loud in your head. So review the task memo, see if it gives you, see if it gives you uh, any hints or tells you expressly how to organize the analysis or the argument section of your performance test. Because that's really the first thing we have to figure out. So the, after we review the task memo, we're gonna do a quick little setup of the skele a little skeletal outline of the macro setup. And I'm gonna walk you through this. So I'll walk you through this. So. Um, you're going to do, uh, you're going to set up the, the skeletal outline. When you do that, um, you have to include the, you want to include at this stage, you want to include your introduction, your conclusion, and, um, and your, you know, just your macro headings. So I'll walk you through what that looks like, but you want to have a heading for introduction, draft your introduction, have a heading for analysis or argument. And it, if you have, if you know what the subheadings are in that section, write those. Put your heading in for your conclusion and draft a quick little conclusion as well. Um, if there is a document that is going to provide the organizing principles, um, if there is a document that provides the organizing principles, which I'll talk about, um, then you wanna go and read that next. That's, that's what you wanna do next. Ultimately, the first thing after reading the task memo and doing your setup, the really first big thing that you're trying to figure out, the problem that you're trying to solve is what is the organization within the argument or the analysis section? What, you know, what are the headings? What issues do I have to resolve? What are the legal questions here? That's really the first thing you've got to figure out. A PT, um, a PT is, um, it's like a puzzle. It's really like a puzzle, but they don't tell you what the puzzle looks like. So the first thing is like figuring out what the organization is in your argument or your analysis section, figuring that out is akin to putting the edges of the puzzle together. So that's what it's like. So you really have to figure that out first. Um, each of these are how much time each task should take you. So reviewing the task memo, five minutes, then you give it, get an additional five minutes to set it up. And then you skim the file, which I'll talk about five minutes there. So there you're 15 minutes in. And then you skim and you read the library, that's 15 minutes. So when you're done with that, that's 30 minutes. So these are each 
you add them together. You add them together. So after you set up the skeletal outline for the PT, then you skim the file. Then you skim the file. A skim, all you are doing when you skim the file is you're trying to just see, does anything pop out at you? Is there anything that's that um, looks incredibly significant that's going to give us any clues about you know, any additional facts that are really important? just to help us get a little bit more understanding about the significance of the cases um, and, and the issues that we're dealing with. It's just a really quick skim. I do not want you reading the file at this point. I don't want you actually reading it at this point. Um, so you skim the file. So you skim the file, that's step three. Step four is really where like the heavy lifting gets going. So there you're skimming a case and statutes, and you're also reading it once you can tell that you're getting to a rule, et cetera. So every case of the statutes, you want to really read them with a purpose. If you know, um, if you know what the issues are that you're dealing with, you're trying to identify which issue does this case deal with? Is, does it go to the first issue? Does it go to the second issue? Does it go to the third issue? So you're really just trying to identify why did they give me this case? What does this case help me solve? What does this case help me solve? Um, <clears throat> so focus on, and, and you'll know that, um, you know that what it's helping you solve by focusing on the analysis of each case. So we're gonna walk through that, not, not going deep into the facts of every case in the library. I generally skip over those. I actually don't read them. I, I say, okay, this is a fact paragraph, keep going, keep going until I start getting to um, the rules. Uh, so we'll practice this. So identify um, why they have given you this case. Identify why they've given you this case. This PT that we're going to go over today is immensely helpful because um, it, it's, it's nice on the organization. And then assign cases to their appropriate issues. Then say, okay, this case goes with the first issue and you're going to make a note of that. Second case goes to the second issue and you're going to make a note of that. So if Smith goes to the first case, Laredo goes to the second case uh, or the second issue. Um, Purcell goes to the third issue. You actually make note of that in your skeletal outline. Um, identify, identify where you are getting your rules, what case you're pulling them from, if you're pulling from a statute, et cetera, and where you're going to draft a rule proof or a case explanation or a rule explanation. So, um, so I'm going to show you what this looks like. You definitely, when you will definitely read every case that you get, but you don't read the entire case. You skip over the fact section. So I'm going to go over what that looks like. Uh, I'm going to go over what that looks like. Um, and a note on this. Uh, well, I'll, I'll show you what this looks like. So this is, I'm just introducing the process, just introducing the process. Then you draft, then this is before you go back to the file, before you go back to the file, you're going to actually draft um, you're going to actually draft your rules and you're going to draft your rule proofs. A rule proof is where you explain what a court held and why. What did a court hold and why? And I give you the formula here for drafting a rule proof. You all remember, like, I want you to take yourselves back to first year legal writing. Take yourself back to first year legal writing. When your professors had you use some acronym, ERIAC, CREAC, CURPAC, ERPAC, uh, I've heard, I've seen BARIAC, something in legal writing where you, you have a, um, an issue that's stated, you have a rule, you have, I call it a rule proof, other professors call it a rule explanation, which is demonstrating, demonstrating what that rule that you, that you are discussing looks like when applied to a set of facts that is given in a case. So I'll talk about that. I call that a rule proof, but you may have called it something else. Um, you may have called it something else. Um, this is really, this is a significant, a really significant piece. Um, not getting bogged down in the library is key to being able to finish a performance test on time. Um, and also not getting, um, not getting bogged down um, really within the facts, um, not getting bogged down just within the facts of the case, that's important. Also, um, knowing, really knowing why you were given each case and, and the statutes as well. You will, you may use some cases more than once. That will happen often. We're going to see that today. We're going to see that today. 
once you are you have drafted your rules and your rule proofs, you are done with the library. You are completely done with it. You don't have to look at it again. You're done with it. That's the goal. I don't want you spending time digging through it. I don't want you to spend time digging through it once we're after this, uh, once we're done with step five, once we're done with step five. Step five, that'll take you about 15 minutes. So notice with step four and step five, you're spending about 30 minutes in the library and writing within the library. So you're spending about 30 minutes there total, total. So after that, after step five, after you've drafted your rules and you've done this in your exam answer, you've done this in your exam answer, then you go and you read the file. Then you go and you actually read the file and you're, the file, it becomes painfully obvious usually um, which issues the facts go to. And usually you read the file and you'll start drafting your analysis. You kind of are going through it and writing, drafting your analysis at the same time. So step six and seven, you can do in conjunction with each other, or if you wanna read the file and then go back and write, you can do that. So that's something that you wanna personalize a little bit. Me personally, I always, when I'm reading the file, I'm like, oh, this I'll like go through it. And then when it looks like it's switching to a new issue, I'll stop and I'll go and I'll write my analysis because I'm it's all fresh and I'm thinking about it. So, um, and again, we're gonna walk through all of this. We're gonna walk through all of this. At the end, you should have five about five minutes. If you're lucky, maybe it's like two minutes. You know, it's not a whole lot of time, but you wanna just spend a little time proofreading. The things to just proofread, make sure that you have, make sure it's, your, it's complete. Make sure that you have actually finished and answered the question that they have asked you. Make sure that you have answered the question that has been asked. Um, make sure that your headings are complete. Make sure that your headings are complete. And if there was, if you had a thought and you started typing something out, and it's just paint, it's just like actually incomplete. You were like, nah, let me not do that. Go back and delete that. So you don't have any like really obviously incomplete things. That's what I would go back and proofread for. Um, that's what I would go back and proofread for. Okay, any questions? We're gonna practice this and I'm gonna talk about this process all throughout the evening, uh, but any questions just right yet? Uh, yeah, Glenn, let me, oh, never mind. Um, so Caroline, somebody, uh, Caroline asked if the library is in order of the issues to address. Not always. It's not always in the order that you want to address them. And the CalVar um, and the UBEs, they've gone back and forth. This one that we're going to see today, it pretty much, I think, is in order. I think they pretty much are in order but they, they aren't always in order. So just keep an open mind. You wanna keep an open mind as you go through, um, as you go through them. I also read all of the cases. I go through the cases in order. I don't jump around. I don't jump around at all. So I just take them in order. I take them in order. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna actually go split screen. It might, um, it might be a little harder to see. It might be a little harder to see, but I'll make it as big as I can. Uh, yeah, uh, Nijoma raised her hand. Oh, maybe let me see on the Q and A. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, in the order that is provided, I read them in the order that they are given to you. I don't ever move around by date. I just, uh, to me, changing the order is kind of is a little bit of a waste of time to me. Um, because I have to read all of it. I need to pay attention to the dates and, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay attention to it. So I just read them. I just read them in order. Um, and I've checked on this with, um, my colleagues recently. I always like to check myself, um, to make sure that like, you know, that what I'm saying is consistent with my colleagues that also teach this stuff. And they all said that they, they all said the same thing. Um, all right, good. I just realized that my dinner is in the oven and I think it's burning. So I'm going to pull that out right now. It's just two feet for me. And then we're going to look at the, uh, then we're going to go and look at the, um, at the PT. So I apologize. I forgot that I put it in one second. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I guess more like early breakfast. Yeah. Some bolognese. Um, okay. So, so we are going to, uh, we're going to go to the task memo. A note about instructions on the PT, just a little note. You all read them once now. They're gonna be the same on the bar exam day, but read them now. 
Um, the one thing I would say to check, um, one thing that I would say to check is just double check and make sure that you're in the fictional state of Columbia. Um, and if you're in the UBE, you're going to be in either Franklin or oh my gosh, what's the other one? Uh, or Olympic or Olympia, Franklin or Olympia. Um, you're going to be in, in one of those jurisdictions. Somebody asked if you should type um, the PT in the answer spot or use the scratch paper. I would absolutely just type it in your answer response because there is no sense in using the scratch paper and then moving it or using, I, I personally, I personally wouldn't use the, the handwritten scratch paper. Um, I think it just makes it a little bit more complicated. But at the end, at the end of the session this evening, if you do want to use a scratch paper, I'll grab my iPad and pencil and I'll like demonstrate how I would do this if I wanted to use a scratch paper. So I'll show you that. Um, I'll show you that as well. Um, so, okay. Um, da, da, da. All right. Um, and I will, I'm going to go through the skimming. I got, um, I got a, a couple of questions. So during the skimming, is there a technique to identify what is important? Yes. I'll go over that. Um, and the anonymous question, uh, I'll show you how to do the headings. I'll I'm going to show you how to do the headings. And I think that'll answer your question. Um, the state doesn't really matter. doesn't really matter. It's just what you're used to. California generally does. I, they pretty much always do Columbia and the UBE generally does Franklin or Olympia. I think it's Olympia or Olympic, but I think it's Olympia. Um, all right. Um, one other tiny little note, it, you should have a file in a library. You should have a file in a library. Once, California only gave a file, once in this history of doing performance tests since like the late 80s or early 80s. I think they started doing PTs in 83 or 84. Uh, and once in the whole history have they ever done it where they just basically had the library within the pile uh, or within the file. Um, and Caroline, I will get to your question. I'll get to your question as well. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is we wanna look at the task memo. We wanna look at the task memo and remember that we're gonna really care pay careful attention to it. We're gonna pay very careful attention to it. Um, all right, so no, it's to applicant, you, um, from Marjorie Turner, who's our supervising attorney, date, this will be the date that you're actually taking the test. So February 23rd, 24th, um, and the name of it. So potential right litigation. So here, here it says, um, here it says Janice Wright, a longtime client. Uh, and I usually have my highlighter on and I'll highlight just while I'm reading the task memo to note who is our client and anything that really stands out. She's retained us on a matter concerning unauthorized credit card charges run up by her son, Ryan, uh, by her son, Ryan, for online purchases connected to an online video gaming website called Gamer Tracks. All right. At Ryan's request, Janice gave him permission to open an account using her credit card. So Janice gave him permission. Um, she told him he could charge no more than $20. He ended up charging $9,000, so big difference there. But she gave him authority to charge no more than $20 and he ends up charging almost 9,000. After receiving her credit card bill, she sent a letter to Gamer Tracks asking for a reversal of the $8,980 charge. Um, so asking for the reversal and she asked for a reversal of the 8980, so plus the 20, it's a total of 9,000. But Gamer Tracks declined, obviously. She would like our help in determining whether she can avoid paying some or all of the charges. So some or all of the charges. So whether she can avoid, the fact that it says whether, I'm thinking, okay, this is probably objective, but we wanna just verify. It says, I have already determined that Ryan was able to and did in fact, and did in fact enter into a contract with Gamer Tracks. So that I may discuss this matter with Janice, please prepare a memorandum that answers the following questions. And I love when they do this, when they tell me what the questions are, because it gives us our headings in our analysis section. So first, they want me to prepare a memo. When it's a memo, generally it's gonna be objective. Generally it's gonna be objective. Um, and he's also not telling you to persuasively argue or she is not telling us to persuasively argue. So it's a memo, that's what I'm preparing. Um, and I want to answer these, the following questions. So 
One, is Ryan able to disaffirm the contract? Two, if so, they have a typo in here from the bar. If so, did Janice's letter disaffirm the contract for Ryan? And three, is Janice liable for the $8,980 charge? Is Janice liable? Do not include a statement of facts in your memo. So there's a special instructions, don't do a statement of facts. Generally speaking, only do a statement of facts if expressly instructed to do so. If expressly instructed to do so. Otherwise don't, otherwise don't do it. It's not a good use of your time. Um, at the very end, I'll answer questions, uh, at the end I'll answer questions about like, if you are told to write a statement of facts, what do you do, et cetera. So uh, I'm happy to answer that, but they're tell us not to do it here. So I'm not gonna do it, um, but do use the facts in its body. So I'm like, okay, so now next step, next step. So step one is I read that, re I reviewed the task memo, I read it. Now I wanna set up my, uh, my skeletal outline. Um, I wanna set up my skeletal outline. A quick, a quick note on the structure of performance tests. A quick note on the structure of the um, performance tests. Most performance tests have these three sections. They have these three sec sections. You have an introduction. You have an introduction where you are, um, where you have, are just reiterating what the task memo tells you to do. You're just reiterating what the task memo tells you to do and you're writing it in the correct tone. So if you're writing, if you're supposed to write objectively, you're writing an objective introduction, which I'll show you what that looks like. Um, if it was persuasive, I'll tell you what that would look like. Then you have a heading, another heading that's either labeled analysis or argument. So analysis or argument. And then um, in here, this is really the bulk of it. This is always really the bulk of your performance test is, is in the analysis or the argument section. Um, and then you have a conclusion section. So there you're gonna reiterate what you want, keep your client's goal in mind, try to incorporate that. And we'll have a canned conclusion for an objective task and sometimes for some of the others too. So I'll talk about what that looks like. So um, a question about um, the meaning of don't have a separate statement of facts. Generally, like if you go, if you think back to first year legal writing, you, like you would have to, in a memo, in a brief, you would have to include a statement of facts, which is a different section that's not doing any legal analysis. It's just stating what are the, what are the uh, relevant facts? What are the relevant facts? So sometimes it's a separate section. We're told not to do one here. If you did, if you did have to do a statement of facts, it would look like this. Oops. I'll just actually mention a, a little bit of it here. Formatting's being a little funny, but that's okay. Um, do two to three paragraphs. And chronological, chronological order. Okay, but they tell us not to do one here, so I'm not going to. So I'm gonna do my setup. So for a memorandum, for a memo, you want to uh, you want it to generally look like this. You want it to generally say at the top memorandum. You want to copy the caption. This is the caption, the top piece here that says the to, the from, the date, and the ray. You want to, you want to include that. Then I have a heading for introduction. The heading for introduction. I have my heading for analysis. I label my the second section analysis when it's objective. If it's a persuasive task that we're given, we're told to write a persuasive task, this would say argument. This would say argument. Um, and I do include these numbers. I do include, um, you know, Roman numeral one introduction, Roman numeral two analysis, Roman numeral three for conclusion. And I do, I actually do number my questions in the intro just so they can see that I'm answering one, two, three, the three questions that were asked. So I do leave those in there. I like to leave it like that. I like to leave it like that. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Um, does it matter if you change to and from? No. Okay. I'm going to get to some of these questions at the end. And I think that some of them will be answered um, as we go. So, okay. So at the start, at the start, um, based on the task mode, I can draft, I can draft a quick introduction. It's just below, please find my analysis, regard, analysis regarding and whatever they ask you to do. 
Here they asked us to answer these three questions. So it's just gonna say below, please find my analysis re regarding one, whether Ryan can disaffirm the contract, two, if so, whether Janice's letter disaffirmed the contract for Ryan, and three, whether Janice is liable for the $8,980 charge. Just those three questions which were listed in the task memo, which were listed in the task memo. Um, and I, so, so I draft my introduction really quickly, then I have my heading for my analysis, and I just type in the headings as they're written when it's objective, I'm just listing the issues. I'm not getting into the law. I'm not incorporating the facts because it's an objective issue because it's an objective analysis. Generally, when you're writing a persuasive performance test, this would be a, this would actually be an assertive statement. It would be a conclusion and you would incorporate both facts and law. You would incorporate both facts and law. So, but here it's objective. So I'm just keeping it simple. Just keep it simple. Do the questions, write them the same way that they listed in the task memo. So I have, is Ryan able to disaffirm the contract? A, if so, did Janice's letter disaffirm the contract for Ryan? Second question. C, is Janice liable for the $8,980 charge? So, and then what I do, and then I also have my conclusion. This is my canned conclusion. I write this conclusion basically every time something to this effect. And I write it at the beginning just so I have it. Just thank you for allowing me to do this analysis for you. If I can be a further assistance on this or any other matter, please let me know. Um, so I just have uh, a quick little thing so it looks complete. And I have it at the outset. That way, if I run out of time, I just like, have it in there. I just have it in there. Um, I have it in there. And then I also put these notations. So this is part of doing this online. This is part of doing it remotely. If I were doing this, if I actually wanted to use my scratch paper, I would do this in a, in a little bit of a shorthand way, but essentially the same thing. So if you go back to legal writing, um, you would have um, under your heading, you, you do ERIAC, CREAC, et cetera. Does that all sound, does that sound familiar to everybody? You'll type in the chat. You'll remember that, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, okay, good, 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 good. Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure it's so hard doing it with this, like this format where instead of like seeing everybody's faces where I can see everybody nodding. Uh, okay, good. But you, but that's familiar. That's familiar. So I put notes in here for each, for the, each of the different little sections that I would have. So I need to have rules obviously to answer this issue. So I put a note, the R is for rule. The R is for rule. And I do type these in. I actually type these in. Uh, and Bernadette is nodding. Thank you, Bernadette. So I type these in. And then I put a note for P. I put a note for P. Um, Andy, that's correct. Andy, you, I don't use law in the headings for objective MMs. So P is what I for what I call the rule proof. You might call it a rule explanation or a case explanation. So any whatever term you use, that's what this is. And then A is for analysis, and I'm going to make some notes there. C is for counterargument. We're not going to have a counterargument for every issue. But I make a note because I want to ask myself as I'm going through the library, am I going to have a counter argument on this issue? Um, I want to figure that out. Uh, and as I'm going through the file. And then C for conclusion. I do each of these in a different paragraph. So I have a rule paragraph. I have a rule proof paragraph. I have an analysis paragraph, counter argument paragraph, if I have one, and a conclusion paragraph. I don't do necessarily, I don't necessarily do a rule proof for every single issue. If it's a very small issue that's very obvious and if it's a very clean law to fact analysis, I don't do a rule proof. I don't do a rule proof. Um, but I put the note here to because I want to ask myself, am I doing a rule proof here? Am I doing a rule proof here? Um, and I will go through drafting a rule proof. I'm going to go through that and show, show it to you. I'm going to show it to you. Um, all right. So I set this up. So I looked at my, um, I look, I, this is step two. So we've just gone through the task memo and then I have done a quick setup and I know what my issues are. I know what my issues are. So next, the next thing we're going to do is, and I'm going to look at the questions really quickly to see if there's any questions about this stage, um, that I need to answer. Uh, it looks like we're okay. 
Um, and the rule proof I'm gonna get to, uh, I'll get to um, explaining what that is a little bit more in depth as we keep going. And then um, Andy asked if I would quote the applicable law in the analysis headings. No, um, I don't, not for an objective, definitely not for objective. And I don't even do it for persuasive. I just tie in the law and the facts for persuasive. And I do have a YouTube video going over um, a persuasive California PT and an objective one. So I do have those. Um, Paul, it doesn't matter if you, um, in the intro, if you interchange the to and from, that's okay. Um, and how much of the statement of fact should you write if you're told it's two to three paragraphs? It's really two to three paragraphs. Um, if you do do that and just do it chronologically, do it chronologically. Paul, I'll talk about the counter argument part. I'll talk about the counter argument part. And Karen, you, you should use, if it's persuasive, you should use the law in your headings, but don't, you don't have to cite, you don't have to cite, but if it's persuasive, incorporate law and facts because that is more persuasive. Um, I have heard Trish asked about the copy and paste. So I have heard that it's actually not gonna work this time. Um, I've heard that it's actually not gonna work this time. Um, I'm not hundred percent on that, but regardless, I wouldn't use it because it caused massive formatting issues for people. And it was a huge headache for people. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it at all. So, so don't use it is my advice, is my advice. Some people, some people do use it. Some people did, you know, did use it in October and were fine with it, but a lot of people had issues with it. Um, I never, ever, ever use it. So um, I don't think it's necessary, but it depends on the person. I'm a pretty fast typer. Um, so yeah, so, all right. So now let's skim through the file. Let's skim through the file. When we're doing a skim of the file, we're just looking to see, does anything jump out? Is there, are there any lists that jump out? Are there, are there any lists that jump out, um, that jump out to me? Or, you know, is there anything that's quoted that stands out, anything like that? There might not be, there may not be, um, but, but sometimes there are. So I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna be doing a skim. I'm gonna be doing a skim and I'm gonna tell you what I am thinking when I am doing my skim, what, what looks significant to me? What looks significant to me? Generally speaking, when you do a skim, you just read the first line, not the first sentence, the first line of each paragraph. Uh, the first line of each paragraph and you see, okay, um, you know, you just see if anything, you know, looks significant or not. So I'll show you what that looks like. And when I'm skimming, I usually have my, um, I usually have my highlighter on. So, all right, so I met with a longtime client, Janice Wright, yesterday. Okay, we know that. The Gamer Tracks website allows users to play a wide array of online video games. Okay. Um, the game, the Gamer Tracks website allows users to buy certain options. So I'm like, these are all the like uh, extra little things that you can buy when you're playing a game. I'm familiar. Sadly, especially during COVID, I feel like I've spent money on this stuff probably too much. Um, so, okay, and I see that in here, like quotes stand out to me. So if I see that, even if it's not part of my skim, I'm gonna look at it. But it says the options include extra, extra weapons um, and extra lives. So I'm familiar, right? These are just like the additional things that you can buy, like in-game purchases that you can buy. Um, okay, so two months ago at Ryan's request, Janice gave Ryan permission to open. Okay, so Janice gave him permission. This sounds pretty familiar from what we already know from the task memo. Um, and again, they say the $20. Ryan opened a Gamer Tracks account. In doing so, he clicked. Okay, so there's, and I, this stands out. So there's some terms of service. And so I, I look, terms of service, I kind of want to just see what they say quick, quickly. So I agree to provide a valid credit card. I agree that I am authorized to use the credit card provided. So I am, he's claiming that he is authorized. I agree that all transactions, um, so I agree that all transactions are final and reverse, irreversible. But this is a kid signing it. This is a kid signing it. I'm under the age of 18. Uh, I reviewed the foregoing. So he's under the age of 18. So I'm like, okay, well, what does Gamer Tracks expect? What does Gamer Tracks expect? I, I'm just like, I, I don't know. I'm a little bit skeptical of Gamer Tracks. And I, generally speaking, generally speaking, your client's going to be able to do what they want to do. Generally speaking, your client's going to win. So I, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be able to, um, that, that Ryan can probably just affirm the contract. 
Um, Janice's letter may or may not have disaffirmed the contract for Ryan. Um, and I'm like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty skeptical of her being liable for the $8,980 charge. Um, so, okay. He says, I'm under the age of 18. I've reviewed the foregoing. Um, and I have their permission. I've reviewed the foregoing terms of service, my parents or guardians, and I have his heard their permission to agree as stated above. To verify, you may contact my parent guardian at jwright at columbiavalley.com, which it actually wants to hyperlink that. Um, Gamer Tracks contacted Janice and she verified that she had given Ryan permission. So this looks really significant to me. This looks significant that, um, to me because she, um, one part when you're when we're skimming the the um, terms of service, I actually do read them in full, and because they're the their terms and it's pretty big, one of the things that I note here it says I am authorized to use the valid credit or debit card provided in any and all amounts up to and including the limit established by the issuer. So, in the terms it says I am able to charge basically as much as I want, even though we know we know that Ryan did not actually have permission to do that. And then here, it's a little problematic because GamerTracks contacted Janice and she verified that she'd given Ryan permission. But I doubt that this, that this permission was, um, was really consistent. I know that it's not consistent with what Janice actually gave Ryan, but I'm doubtful that it would even be valid to require her to be uh, liable for the $8,980. So, okay. So after opening the GamerTracks treasure account, Ryan started playing, okay. Um, and I see again, the $20 is 8,980. And then when Janice received her credit card bill, she sent a letter to Gamer Tracks asking for a reversal. Um, so when she got her bill, then she sent a letter asking for a reversal. Janice has not yet paid her credit card bill pending consultation with us. So she's not paid it yet. And then we have this letter here that's the Ray line, things that stand, Ray line stand out to me. So I see it's unauthorized charges. And then it's just brief. Um, and this is specifically about going to question um, issue B here, specific to that. So I'm writing to request that you reverse the amount of $8,980. I authorized my son, Ryan, to use my credit card to charge no more than $20 for options for online video games. So she's explaining the situation, which is consistent from what we saw above. I did not learn until I received my credit card bill that he had used it to charge an additional $8,980 for such options. Thank you for your prompt attention, Janice Wright. That's it. So quick little, quick little skim of the file. I looked at the clock before I started reading out loud and skimming and it was at 48. It was at 48 and now it's at 54. So me talking out loud doing this, and I know I talk a little quickly, um, but it took me eight minutes. It took me eight minutes talking about all of it. So the, you really do want to just go through it quickly and spend no more than five minutes on it. Just, and we get a pretty good sense. We get a pretty good sense of uh, what happened here just by doing that quick skim. Still really similar to what was in the task memo, but we got a little bit more information here. Significantly, the terms of service and that they did actually contact Janice and she said, I give permission. Okay, all right. So now, now we are, so we have uh, reviewed the task memo. We set it up. It, we have our headings in there and we have our headings in the analysis section. Then we've skimmed the file. We've skimmed the file and we have a pretty good grasp of what's going on. Now it's the next part that's the challenging part. It's skimming and reading the library, skimming and reading the library. So remember, we're reading every case with a purpose. We're reading every case with a purpose saying, which issue am I using this for? If there are statutes, we're gonna, um, we're gonna try to figure out what issue that we're gonna use them for. A quick note about statutes. If you're given a lot of statutes, you generally speaking want to, I would look at the headings, kind of go through them quickly, but get to the cases to see, the cases will often tell you which statutes are more important. Not always, but they're gonna point you in the right direction and they're gonna give you so much more detail about, um, the cases are gonna tell you a lot about where you're gonna use the different statutes and what issues they're relevant to. So don't at the outset, even if the statutes are first, like we have here, even if they are listed first or given to you first, don't spend a bunch of time parsing them if you get if you get a lot of them. Here we get quite a few. If you're given like a single statute that's different, then you do wanna pull it apart a little bit. You wanna pull it apart um, 
and see, you know, what are the elements, et cetera. You want to, you do want to pull it apart a little bit. Parsing a statute is, is a bit tricky. It's a, it's one of the, I think one of the harder skills, one of the tougher things to do. Um, so if it's something that you, that's like not your strong suit, generally, even if you only have one, go to the case, because the case is probably going to talk about the statute and it's going to give you some tips. It's going to give you some tips. So Statutes, I think, tend to, in my experience with, you know, working with students, they tend to frighten people a little bit. If that's you, totally fine. Go to the cases first. Go to the cases first. Let's see. Um, all right. So which part are being incorporated in the statutes? Um, I, Carol, and I'm going to talk about this. Somebody asked about uh, incorporating the statutes, where they go. They're going to go in your rule section. They're gonna go in your rule section under the appropriate issue. And I'll show you that because we're gonna actually do that with this particular PT tonight. Um, so, all right. Yeah, and, and this, this file um, is, is a little short. It's, it's maybe a page or two shorter than like, I think standard, if there really is a standard. California has had a one page file before. They've had a, or a file with a task memo and one document and that's it. That's the main EPT, I think from 20 February, 2018. So they've done that before. This one, it was like oh, a little a little light to me, but it just felt light to me because there wasn't, it. files feel heavier when there's a transcript. Feels like there's more to get through, but I love having a transcript. So, but yeah, this file, this file was a little bit light. All right, so now we're gonna get into the, we're gonna get into the library, which is really, I think the crucial part and you've got to um, be methodical when you're in the library. You've got to be methodical. The thing you want to avoid is having to read and reread stuff. You want to avoid that. Um, and I know it happens and it happens sometimes just like when, when stress gets to us. Um, but the library has so many clues in there for you. There are so many clues, especially on this one. So, okay, so skimming and reading. So we're skimming and reading. So we skim a case until we start to get to rules. And then we start reading it in depth and highlighting and really paying attention to it. So let me go down. Okay. Let me go down. All right. So now I see, I look at my library and for me, even I was like, holy cow, there's a lot in this library. There's a lot in this library that also happens too. like somebody mentioned that, you know, that this file seemed a little bit lighter than some others. Library is a little bit heavier. Library is a little heavier. So sometimes we have the reverse. Sometimes we have a heavier file and a lighter library. Sometimes they're pretty even. So this one tells us that there's gonna be quite a bit of law in, in, the, um, in our um, work product that we're preparing. So I see here though, we have Columbia Civil Code, Columbia Family Code, Miller v. Miller, Brady v. Thomas, Laredo v. Purcell. So we have a lot in here. One, one thing that I didn't do on the file that I'm just remembering is I do like to, I like to highlight the start of every new document, the start of every new document. And I'll show you what I mean with the library. So, okay, so here, and I always pick, I always pick the same colors for certain things. When I'm highlighting rules, I use red, although I do pink when I'm teaching because it's, um, it's easier for you all to read if I, if I use pink. Uh, but I think of like red rules um, and I do analysis in blue. I do analysis, I, or I, uh, I highlight in this like light blue, but just pick a color and stick with it. When it's any new document, I, I do this. I highlight it just because when I'm scrolling, it makes it easier. I'm like, oh, there's a new document. Which one is it? And I can scroll quickly, which is important when your screen is not very big and you're trying to do something quickly. So if I would, it, you see how when you scroll, if you highlight that, it stands out and then it tells you to slow down. So it acts as a little cue to help you. So I see here, there's select provisions of the Columbia Civil Code. And I see there's all these things regarding agency. I'm like, okay, there's all this stuff regarding agency, it's fine. So agency defined, actual authority, apparent authority, creation of actual authority, creation of apparent authority. Here, I just, um, I just highlight what they are, the different headings, creation of apparent, creation of actual, what defining a parent, defining actual, and then defining agency. And then what do we have down here? The binding effect. Okay, and then we have Columbia Family Code. A minor's power to disaffirm a contract. Again, minor's power to disaffirm. Um, and then I see here too, I'm like, well, I, these, these look really similar. So I, I, I pause for a second and I'm, 
And I look and it just says a minor may make a contract in the same manner as an adult subject to the power of disaffirmance under 6702. And 6702 is, um, except as provided in 6703, a contract of a minor may be disaffirmed by the minor or by the minor's parent or guardian before majority or within a reasonable time afterwards, subject to this exception. So exceptions to the power to disaffirm. So a contract otherwise valid entered into during majority may not be disaffirmed on the ground that, so you, when can you not? maybe may not be disaffirmed. If the contract is to pay the reasonable value of things necessary for the, the support of the minor's families, these things have actually been furnished and the contract is entered into by the minor, not under the care of a parent, a parent or guardian able to provide for the minor or the minor's family. So I look at that exception. The reason I looked at this just briefly, I skimmed it, was these laws, these look like they directly answer call one and call two. So I, I make a note of that. I say, okay, there's these, there are these rules and they look like they go to the first two issues, which makes me think that all of these go to the third issue. That, that these one, two, well, there's like five or six different statutes in here regarding agency. And it sounds like, um, and also just having skimmed the file and being familiar with general agency principles, it sounds like all of these statutes are going to be relevant, or at least, you know, at least some of them will be relevant for issue three. A little note here, the fact that there are all of these statutes, there's what, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's six statutes here regarding the third issue. And then you have three regarding issues one and two. That is a clue that issue three is more important. That's a clue that issue three is more important. And we always wanna be looking for, for those clues. Um, we always wanna be looking for those clues of, you know, where are the points on this particular performance test? Where are the, where are the points? On this one, I have to sneeze. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, on this particular performance test, for those of you that took it, you know what this, you know, you know how it felt. Um, uh, oh, thank you. Um, this, everybody's so friendly and nice. Thank you for all the what's use. Um, on this particular performance test, um, we, where I saw people not get passing answers was where they didn't have enough time for the third issue. So you do, you wanna be thinking about, about allocating your time and which issues are more important, which issues are more important and where are the points, where are the points? So, uh, so first clue is just within these statutes, right? But I wanna go to the cases, I wanna go to the cases. So I have this Miller v. Miller case and I just read in order and I have my, my pink highlighter up because I'm gonna use pink to highlight rules. So now this is how you skim and when you start reading. So if it's, generally speaking, when the bar examiners put a PT together, when they put the case together, these are based on real cases, but they have shortened them, condensed them and only included really what, what you need. But there is some, one of the skills that they're testing in a PT is whether you're able to discern what's relevant from what's irrelevant. So there is extra stuff in a PT, unlike the essays. In a California bar essay, in a California bar essay, there are no red herrings. There are no red herrings. They're not trying to, I mean, they are kind of, they're tricky, but they are not trying to trick you by including stuff that's totally irrelevant. That's just a red herring. What they are doing, what in a PT though, they're gonna give you more information than you need to answer the question. They're gonna give you more than you need. So you have to balance your time and you have to kind of fight that. So generally speaking, the most important facts in a case are going to be stated in the court's analysis of the case, in the court's application of the law to the facts. So I don't spend time sitting here parsing through all of the facts. I literally skip them. I, I literally have not read them. I've literally not read them. Um, I have read the selected answers and I've seen like if they use them and they do a little bit, but not necessary. Um, most of the, um, Pretty much all of the PTs for California, I've written answers to every single one. I've done every single one and I do the same thing. I intentionally actually don't read the, don't read the facts from the cases so that I can say it when I'm teaching it um, and show you that you don't actually need to do that. Cause it's a big, you all know it. Like how many of you like click on the, I don't know, type yes or whatever. 
if you have gotten, if you've run out of time on a PT and you've spent time trying to figure out factually what happened in each of the cases in the library, have you all done that? Like, I should get almost everybody saying yes, I have done it for sure, right? Yes, right? You totally, totally do that um, all the time, yeah. So you don't have to do that. You don't have, the, the most important facts are gonna be within the analysis. On a rare occasion, and I can tell you there is one PT in, of the California 90 minute PTs where I felt like I didn't wanna go back and read them because I didn't feel like I had enough in, in the analysis of the case. One, in one case, have I felt like I actually needed to do that? And it, you, I really didn't, but I wanted a little bit more info. I wanted a little bit more info. Um, and it's the, um, uh, and I'll show you, um, I will show you how you write it. Cause in the analysis, they give you the important facts. So, so this is, so we're gonna go through, we're gonna go through this. So bias complaint, Bryce Miller sought judgment against his mother, Josephine. Okay. Um, and I see here that $26,000 issued when he was under 18. Bryce was born March 11th, 1940. Okay, let's skip that. By this action, Bryce seeks to recover the $26,000 received by Josephine. So received by Josephine. Okay, um, entering judgment for Josephine. So, okay, wait, actually. Um, I see here, I see in the next paragraph that they say in entering judgment for Josephine, the trial court found that and I, but I see above that there was a mention of a Columbia Family Code section. So I actually wanna read that because that tells me there's a rule. So by this action, Bryce seeks to recover the $26,000 received by Josephine, received by Josephine. So, and this is telling us it's getting to procedure. Usually when you start to see procedure, what has happened procedurally, it's gonna start getting to rules and that's when you need to start paying attention. So there can be no doubt that Josephine held this money for Bryce. By her contract with him, she had relinquished any, uh, any right to any of it. He was entitled to recover all of it, unless fam Columbia Family Code Section 6703 stood in the way. Okay, so under that provision, so 6703, a minor under the care of a parent who is unable to provide for him may contract to pay the reasonable value of things necessary for his support and that of his family and may not disaffirm such a contract. Okay, so there's a rule. I'm highlighting it because that's a rule under that provision. The way you tell the difference between a rule and analysis is a rule speaks in general terms. A minor under the care of a parent, a minor under the care of a parent, not saying Josephine and Bryce or Janice and Ryan, right? So we look for a rule because it's stated in a generic way. That's how we know the difference between a, what is a rule versus what's analysis. And next. Next sentence, this being true, it must follow that the minor can authorize the use of money for him for these purposes and cannot recover the money thus paid out. So there's another rule. Okay, and then when they get into the more specifics, it says, then I wanna say, okay, well, there's my analysis and I'm gonna switch colors. And the reason that I use different colors is because I'm not writing my rules and my rule proofs now. I'm going through the entire library saying, where am I using each thing from the library? You've got to use every case and you're going to use some, maybe not all of the statutes from the different codes because we have family code and civil code. So we're going to use some of the civil code, some of the family code, maybe all, maybe all, but we, we're not 100% sure yet. But I want, I'm, I'm identifying, I'm highlighting where are my rules and where, what am I using this case for? Um, so in entering judgment for Josephine, the trial court found that she expended the $26,000 she had received for herself and for Bryce. That finding, however, was insufficient to support the judgment. The court did not find that Josephine expended the money for herself and for Bryce for things necessary for their support. And they, they italicize for things necessary for their support. So that's really important. Nor could the court have so found. The evidence showed that at all relevant times, Josephine had an independent and substantial source of income. It also showed that she expended the $26,000 she had received as she had herself admitted for the good things of life, not necessities, not necessities. So, so what this is for, um, what this is for is, uh, can the minor disaffirm the contract? Can the minor disaffirm the contract? Cause that's what 6703, stands for. That's what 6703. So here I make note that I'm going to use um, family code 6703. And this case, I don't look, this is Miller.
Miller, and then I'm going to do a rule proof for Miller. This is the only issue that Miller talks about. So I'm going to do a rule proof for that. I don't have to read all of this stuff. It's not a lot, but you can get bogged down in it and it's not necessary. It is not necessary to read it. Um, Cause here it tells us, it tells us could, um, uh, it tells us that Bryce seeks to recover the $26,000 um, and buy her contract with him. So he's trying to, he is trying to disaffirm the contract that he had with his mother. And can he do that? Can he do that? And he can do it if it's not for the necessaries of life. Here they said it wasn't for the necessaries of life. So I just make a note in here. I just um, uh, make a note in here um, of where what I'm going to do. Like, what am I doing with this case? Why did they give it to me? What issue does it go towards? And I just make a note here. I am not writing my rules yet because I want to reserve judgment. I want to reserve judgment and say, okay, am I confident in this? And then it makes it easier too when you have to actually have to go back and write. Um, Cause we want to do like thinking, we want to think through the library and then write. And when I'm writing, I'm not really thinking. Although thinking generally is writing, but not here. We're not in that at that point. Okay, now I'm on to the next case. Now I'm on to the next case and I have, this is Brady V. Thomas. I'm going to highlight it, the dark blue. And then I say, okay, Martha Thomas and her minor son, Craig, appeal the judgment. Okay. Um, in 1999, Brady entered into an artist manager contract with Martha and Craig. Okay. So I see that he was 10, so he's a minor. And it sounds like some child actor contract. I feel like these always get litigated or often do. In 2001, Craig obtained a recurring acting role in the Acme Television Network show, The Go-Kart Kid. Okay. So he's got a contract. Um, in 2002, Brady filed suit against Craig. So once they start to get to procedure, then I'm gonna start paying attention. I'm gonna start paying attention here. Uh, and I'm not gonna necessarily start highlighting, but I'm gonna start, I know that they do the procedure and then they're gonna get into rules. So now I've just said, I don't really have to go into all of these three paragraphs of detail. So that saves me time. So in 2002, Brady filed suit against Craig for breach of contract, for breach of contract. After a bench trial, the court found that Brady had proven her case by a preponderance of the evidence and awarded her commissions of $154,700. In doing so, it rejected Craig's defense that the contract was invalid because Craig was a, time, a minor at the time he entered into it. Craig appealed from the ensuing judgment. Then it says, as a general proposition, anytime I see that, I'm like, okay, they're going to give me a rule. They're going to give me a rule. I'm like, great. This is like, that's their hint. They're telling you. So as a general proposition, parental consent is required for the provision of a service of provision of services to minors for the simple reason that minors may disaffirm their own contracts to acquire such services. According to Columbia Family Code 6701, a minor may make a contract in the same manner as an adult subject to the power of disaffirmance provided by Columbia Family Code 6702. In turn, and then they're just telling us what the Columbia Family Code says. So because they're just basically quoting it, I don't, I know I'm going to double check the family code to make sure that it's the same, but it's just telling me, um, it's just basically reiterating it. So, which is great, easy. In turn, Columbia Family Code section 6702 states that generally a contract of a minor may be disaffirmed by the minor or the minor's parent or guardian before majority or within a reasonable time afterwards. When I highlight my rules, I break between every rule. So I'm so that I know that there's a little space here. Okay, new rule, new rule. Every sentence that I read, I'm asking myself, is this a restatement of a rule that's like already been stated or is it a new rule? So you wanna pay attention and parse that. I wouldn't worry about this so much if you're like uncomfortable with PTs, but if you're a little bit more advanced or as you get better, as you get better, ask yourself, is this just restating another, the rule? Often they will say, in other words, it means this, and they'll state something more simply. So it, when they say in other words or something to that effect, they're really like, you don't have to include both ways of stating it, which saves you time in typing. So the law shields minors from their lack of judgment and experience and under certain conditions vests in them the right to disaffirm their contracts. This, this is, essentially restating the rules, but some people like it. So you could include it, but I'm actually not going to, because I don't think it's totally necessary because it really is saying um, what the other family code provisions that I've just read, it's restating what that say. 
And then it says, although in many instances, such disaffirmance may work a hardship upon those who deal with the minor, the right to avoid contracts is conferred by law upon a minor for his protection against his own improvidence of the designs of others. So it's telling us the reason for the rule. That's policy. That's policy. People often um, have a little bit of a hard time discerning what's policy from rule. But here it just says, um, if it's talking about like the impact of a rule, like here it may work a hardship. That's telling you the impact the rule has or why did we create this? You know, like um, in, a, in a performance test that discusses unemployment, they say, you know, we need this. Um, I mean, they, what do they say? Um, and now I'm having a hard time. The, the social good of having unemployment insurance, right? So to protect those members of society that would be otherwise, you know, suffer extreme hardship, we have unemployment insurance. So we say, you know, we want to protect those individuals um, from being put in such a bad position and, and having to resort to some something negative that we don't like as a society. So, so here they say um, the right to avoid contracts is, con is conferred by law for his protection against his own improvidence of the designs of others. So I like to highlight policy on green. You policy, it is great generally to use as a bootstrapping argument to strengthen your argument. It's really good to use if you see a counter argument. You want to use policy to come to you know to fight against that. So it's it's good to use. Um, it says in the next sentence too, it is the policy of the law. So here they're telling you more explicitly to protect a minor against himself and his indiscretions and immaturity, as well as the machinations of other people, and to discourage adults from contracting with a minor. So here, like this is a restatement of the policy from the previous sentence. So all of this like, is basically them restating stuff and you didn't need to type all of it. Some people though, like when you read carefully and you ask yourself, do I need this or is it just a restatement? Um, they'll just include everything and then that can lead to running out of time. So you know, go through it carefully and ask yourself those questions. If you're unsure, just include it though. If you're unsure, err on the side of inclusion. So, and then I want to go back. I'm going to keep reading. Any loss occasioned by the disaffirmance of a minor's contract might have been avoided by declining to enter into the contract in the first place. So they're just saying like, look, buyer beware or seller beware, I guess, in this case. So simply stated, and then they say again, like this is them saying, like restating it. Simply stated, one who provides a minor with services does so at his or her own risk. And I like that. Like that's a nice little pithy phrase. Like do it at your own risk. And where I think that Ryan's going to be just affirming the contract, Janice isn't going to be liable, et cetera. I think that I like, I like to have those little phrases that I can incorporate. And then it says here, no specific language is required to communicate an intent to disaffirm a minor's contract. This is like broad. It's not talking about specifics, but it does give us something we can apply. A minor's contract may be avoided by any act or word disclosing an unequivocal intent to repudiate its binding force and effect. Okay, and then they say, we find that Martha, as soon as they go into the specific people, there's the analysis. There's the analysis, so I'm gonna highlight blue. We find that Martha's certified letter was sufficient to constitute a disappointment of the contract by Craig because it stated that Martha and Craig were terminating the contract. So I'm gonna show you this. This is the analysis. My rule proof that I'm gonna write for this, you, I didn't have to go through and include all of this detail. It's confusing as heck to read this and keep track of all the parties. Like that takes a lot of brain power. And I usually have to like diagram that stuff out. Like if it's for an actual case and I'm litigating and I'm not um, like, I'm not, you know, in a 90 minute timed exam. I wanna actually go through that stuff carefully. But here you don't have time. You don't have time. Here, they tell you what is more important right here. Also, look at the depth of analysis of the issue here. There are a lot of rules, there's some policy, but the depth of analysis here is pretty simple. It's also pretty, like this rule, this rule is just like, there's no specific language required to communicate an intent to disaffirm. So it's, it's so broad, it's so broad saying like, it's really easy to disaffirm a contract. So did Janice's letter disaffirm a contract? I think based on this rule, it's gonna be pretty easy to say yes. I think it's gonna be pretty easy to probably say yes. I'm not totally sure yet, but 
think it's going to be pretty easy. But the level of depth of analysis of this issue tells us that issue two is pretty straightforward, that issue two is pretty straightforward. So I'm going to make notes here about um, the different sections. So rules 6701, 6702, and 6703. And what case is this, Brady and Brady? I'm going to have a real proof of Brady and um, yeah. Some often so, and sometimes, um, not, not with this particular performance test, but sometimes, especially where you're told like a particular outcome, um, sometimes you can tell whether you're going to affirm or to analogize to or distinguish from a particular case. We might not be able to tell that here yet because it's objective and we haven't really gone through the file enough. Um, but sometimes it actually is very obvious. If I could tell at the outset, and I do think um, I do think that Ryan's going to be able to disaffirm the contract. In Miller, they found that they were able to disaffirm the contract. So I'm going to say analogize to Miller. Here, they said that the letter did disaffirm. I think that that I'm probably going to be able to analogize to um, to Brady. I'm not totally sure yet. And don't be, if you're not sure, don't make the note, but you can, you can notate that here. Also, if you see a counter argument that's really obvious, if you see an obvious counter argument, um, then, then, you know, pay attention to that. Pay attention to that. Here, one thing I did note about Brady, one thing I did note is that she just, she informed the, the creditor that they were terminating the contract. She just said, we're terminating it. Here, I remember from reading the task memo that Janice asked, them to reverse the charges, which is slightly less forceful language. So there may be a counter argument here, but if you didn't see that yet, you wouldn't have noted it, but, and that's fine. I think you would see it a little bit later. You all doing okay? Yeah, okay, good. I figure, but just wanna make sure. And I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna explain what I put in the real proof in a minute. I know that's like the thing that, that, gets, that gets people a little bit. So I will show that in a second. Um, yeah, okay, cool. All right, now let's go to the next case. Let's go to the next case. Um, Laredo v. Purcell, Laredo v. Purcell. So, oh, and I can, I can slow down, sorry. When I get excited and I get excited, then I talk quicker. Like this has always been a thing since I was a kid, so. I will try to slow down, I'll slow down. Um, and thanks for letting me know that because, you know. Um, yeah, okay, good, Rosie, good. I like all the, um, one of the things, one of the things that, uh, that if you took this PT in October and you're trying to figure out like where you went right and where you went wrong, it's really good to, that's why I try to like explain decisions, but try to like figure out, okay, did I do that? You know, did I see this particular thing? So, okay. Um, Oh, thanks, Brett. Um, all right. So I'm going to highlight Laredo. I'm going to highlight Laredo. Yeah, Caroline, I can, um, there's a question. Let me see. Uh, and Bucci, do you have a question? I can let you talk. No, I was just raising my hand up when I was. Uh, oh, 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 just say yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Okay, good. This is so different from the other, um, the other way. All right, all right. So, um, so let's get into Laredo. Let's get into Laredo. Uh, so Linda Laredo brought an action for breach of contract against Purcell Fruit. Okay, that's facts. I'm going to skip it. Purcell's theory at trial and on appeal. Um, okay, it, they're they're getting into theories. Sometimes I like to look at that, but here I didn't. Purcell's theory at trial and on appeal is at hand to not have actual authority. So I'm like, okay, here's those other statutes, right? Here's all those other statutes. And, I'm, and I remember, I'm like, oh yeah, none of those statutes were talked about in the other two cases. So I'm thinking, okay, I have these other six statutes, there's six statutes that haven't been used yet. And now they're going to start talking about them. So I'm thinking, okay, six statutes for one issue. That means that this is a bigger issue, that this is a bigger issue. So, all right. So actual authority, um, 
And it does, it does actually get into Columbia law. It does, I see Columbia with a capital C there. So I actually do want to start reading. I didn't read it like full confession. I didn't actually read this when I wrote it for the first time. Uh, or when I did this the first time and you don't have to, but I'm going to do it um, here. So Purcell's theory at trial and on appeal is that Hand did not have actual authority to make any contract of sale with Laredo. Under Columbia law, actual authority exists. And let me get my right highlighted. Under Columbia law, actual authority exists when at the time of taking action that has legal consequences for the principal, the agent reasonably believes, the agent reasonably believes in accord with the principal's manifestations to the agent that the principal wishes the agent so to act. Columbia Civil Code section 3801. Purcell claims that the evidence introduced at trial shows that at the time of his dealings with Laredo, Hand did not and could not uh, reasonably believe that it wished him to enter in, into any contract of sale. Okay. All right, so we're talking about actual authority. In contrast, Laredo's theory at trial and on appeal is that at the very least, Hand had the apparent authority to make the contract of sale with her. Under Columbia law, apparent authority exists when a third party, when a third party reasonably believes that the actor has authority to act on behalf of the principal and that belief is traceable to the principal's manifestations. These are, and one of the instructions in the, for, the, for the PT is you can bring in your general knowledge of the law, you can bring that in to bear. If you're familiar with the case that they see, like maybe you've actually read this case before, disregard that because it's been edited. But if, if we're talking about general agency principles, it's gonna be the general agency principles that you know. So you can bring that in. So I'm like, okay, great. So talking about agency, I know agency. So this is good. And this is exactly what I know. So I'm like, great. I didn't know all this stuff and I'm happy. Um, all right. Laredo claims that whatever the evidence introduced at trial might show about Han's actual authority to enter into the contract of sale with her, it shows his apparent authority to do so. So regardless of actual authority, there was apparent authority. And then it says here, Laredo's theory prevailed below. It prevails here as well. And I'm like, which one was Laredo's? I was like, oh yeah, that was the apparent authority. So Laredo's, so now they're getting, they're talking about Laredo. They're talking about Laredo and um, they're talking about Laredo. And then I want, because of that, I know they're doing the analysis and I want to pay attention. Okay. Look at, look at the size of this paragraph here, which is all analysis. Look at the size of it. It's, you know, a solid half a page a little over half a page, compare that to how much analysis is here. Just a little bit, right? And how much analysis of the issue is here? Just a little bit, right? So this tells us, this tells us how much, uh, um, this tells us the weight of the issues. This tells us that most of the points are in this issue three. So Laredo's theory pre prevailed below and it prevails here as well. The evidence introduced at trial establishes the following facts. Over many years, Purcell has entered into contracts of sale as well as contracts of consignment for oranges in Colombia. Hand was Purcell's sole agent in Laredo's area. Hand drove a truck provided to him by Purcell on which was printed in large bold letters, Henry Hand, agent for Purcell Fruit Co. Hand had in his possession, I'm like hand had in hand, um, Hand had in his possession form contracts of sale printed by Purcell and bearing Purcell's name. This is all so apparent that Hand is Purcell's agent, that Hand is Purcell's agent, um, which I know we don't have here. So I know we don't have here. I know by reading this, that I'm going to distinguish. I'm going to distinguish from this case. Um, Purcell had always performed, uh, well, not distinguished, but that this is, um, that there is going to be a lack of apparent authority. Um, Purcell had always performed every contract of sale had, uh, hand had entered into. So they always perform and had never disavowed any. All of these facts were well known to Laredo and to the other orange growers in the area. So, so this was also known to Laredo and to everybody else. So he's got a reputation. Like everybody knows Hand is um, uh, Purcell's agent. Like everybody knows that. So in addition, in addition, Don Gordon, the owner of Purcell, 
visited Laredo and the other orange growers in the area at the beginning of the season to tell them that Hand would be calling on them, to tell them that Hand would be calling on them. Um, perhaps Purcell had not granted Hand actual authority to enter into a contract of sale with Laredo on Purcell's behalf, or perhaps it had revoked such authority before the fact, but that matters not. Hand had apparent authority to enter into a contract of sale with Laredo on Purcell's behalf. Oh, I'm getting hands raised. Is there an issue? Or is it okay? Okay. Um, all right. So, but that matters not. Hand had apparent authority to enter into a contract of sale with Laredo on Purcell's behalf. Laredo reasonably believed that Hand had authority to act on Purcell's behalf, and that belief was traceable to Purcell's own words and conduct. In light of Hand's apparent authority, there was unquestionably a contract of sale between Laredo and Purcell. The judgment is affirmed. Okay, so you see all this analysis here for this issue. Um, this tells us that this is where the points are. And I know this before I'm even halfway through. And this is what's really important because I know I need to allocate my time. I know I need to get through the first two issues quickly and spend my time on this third issue. I would, I'm still gonna do the issues in order and analyze them in order, but um, I'm gonna, I know that I need to, you know, what I need to do. I know not to go overly in depth and over explain the first issue. I know because I've got to get to that third issue. Um, so, so now, now the next thing that we're gonna do, so we've skimmed when we read the library, we've read each case with purpose. Um, we focused on the analysis of the case and the rules and we, we've assigned the cases to their appropriate issues. So here, the liability, this is gonna be, um, I'm just gonna put in here civil code sections. Uh, and so is Janice liable for the charge civil code? Um, and what is this case, Chris Laredo? I guess Laredo, yeah. And I'm going to do a rule proof of Laredo. All right. Um, good. Um, because I had all this now, the, the determination. So um, somebody asked if I, because I had all this analysis, is that how I made this determination? I think you're referring to the determination that third issue was the most important. Yes. It's the depth of analysis of the cases in the particular issues. The first case, it's pretty quick analysis regarding can a minor disaffirm a contract. Um, second case is very little analysis of um, the second issue of what does it take to, for a parent to disaffirm. Um, and then the third issue, there's a lot more analysis of whether, whether somebody is, is liable, plus we have six statutes. Um, Paul asked how long has this analysis taken so far? Um, I mean, we started at quarter after I'm at, I've been doing a bunch of talking and it's, I'm a little over an hour into it with, with all the talking and like before I even started getting into the performance test. So I would say I'm probably, probably close to close to getting to close to an hour, getting to close to an hour, but I've been talking. So I did this. I actually wrote my, my whole PT in probably 80 minutes today. So, um, how did I determine the six statutes apply to the third issue? Because they weren't, none of the statutes were mentioned in the first two cases. And then they are mentioned finally in the third case. And the third case is dealing with agency. And this is talking about Janice being liable, Janice being liable for her son, Janice being liable for her son. Um, yeah, there's also, there is another PT that's incredibly similar to this one. There's another one that's really similar that's a UBE. PT called uh, In Ray Brian Carr, C A R R. I don't know if it's available online for free anymore, but if you look for it, it's it's incredibly similar. Um, so yeah, that was good. Um, all right, so now I want to take just a little quick break. All right, you all back. Um, the video will be posted. Sometimes it takes like 24 hours. It takes some time to process it. So it'll be, it'll be up there. Um, it'll be up there. Um, we get it up fairly, fairly quickly. I feel like, um, yeah, Elizabeth, you can talk. Um, yeah, I just had a question on 
uh, when I did the outline, you know, before we joined or whatever, for the third issue that is Janice liable for the 8980 charge, I also put to talk about Miller. Is there a reason why oh, you yeah. didn't think Miller was relevant? Um, I don't, let me see. Um, cause, cause Miller I, I doesn't really talk about agency. No, I just put it for the, like the necessity because the, you know, oh. the 26 was a necessity. So that's the only reason I added it as like a supplement to like, I would yeah, put Laredo uh, first and then like as a supplement. You're not wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're not wrong to do that. You're not wrong to do that. That's totally fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, of course. All right. So, um, so let me just do that. Okay. All right. Um, okay, let me just check through the questions. Okay. I will talk about, um, let me just go through some of these questions really quickly. And I am, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna like show you some drafting. I'm not gonna do drafting of all of it, but I'm gonna show you some drafting. Um, in a PT, can you ever find against your client? I'm gonna say that you could, but it's so rare. Like you, what, what will, it's rare that your client's going to like totally, totally lose, but you will have issues that your client loses. Like there, it, there can be, um, there, there can be, um, an issue that your client loses. It's not critical. Um, like it's, for example, if you have, um, there's, there's a UBE PT called Bomer versus Bomer. And in that one, um, there's a factor test and there's six factors five of the factors either go against your client or are neutral. One factor goes in your client's favor. And it's that that's the only factor that matters. The error that people made when they took it though, was they were just like gung ho on every single factor being in their client's favor, but that's wrong. It was, it was like the facts didn't go that way. So you have to take a, you really have to take a methodical approach and know that your client will probably overall get what they want. They're gonna probably get what they want, but they may not get everything that they want. There's another one um, in Ray Field Hogs. It's a UBE PT, and there, um, there the client doesn't get all of their goals achieved, but the big goal, the most important ones, they do. So that's that's really what you want to look for. That's what that's what will happen. Um, uh, dun, dun. Um, a brief generally does have a similar layout. Yes. So th the answer to that is yes, that a, a brief generally does have a similar layout introduction. Instead of saying analysis for Roman numeral two, it'll say argument. And then you're going to have your headings on a brief. Your headings will generally incorporate both law and facts. And this will be, an, this will be you taking a position. This is taking a position rather than just being neutral. Like here, it's just, is Ryan able to disaffirm the contract? If this were a brief, I would say Ryan can disaffirm the contract pursuant to the family code, um, or Ryan can disaffirm the contract because um, the contract was not for the necessaries of life. So I'm incorporating the legal element, which is for the necessaries and the facts. So that's, if I were to take this and write it in a brief and have a persuasive heading, that's what it would look like. That's what it would look like. Um, answer live, done. Policy. I will go over the policy. I'll, I'll go over the policy as well when we get back to that. Um, that uh, so somebody asked how many PTs I suggest you do or look at before the exam. I would go through. I would go through the all of the California performance tests. Um, a thing of note in all of the California performance tests, or my, my rule of thumb is generally eight. I usually want people to do at least eight PTs, complete them in full. Depends on how many you've done so far. Like, do I want you to do eight in the next two weeks? Probably not, probably not. I want you to at least look at that many, but you might not write out eight in full. You might go through the whole process and go through this process of writing out the rules and the rule proofs, having read the library or gone through the library and having read the file. And so, you know, you might make it a 45 minute or an hour process as opposed to the full 90 minutes. But um, you should definitely have at least written out three, four PTs and hopefully more than that, hopefully more than that. But my rule of thumb is generally eight. Uh, my rule of thumb is generally eight um, total having done. But this is a weird bar cycle because it's short for California. Um, 
that one. Um, I don't think it's advisable to just use IRAC to issue rule application conclusion is because you do need to do some explaining of the cases. If you just do, so somebody asked, is it advisable to use IRAC instead of doing IRAC or IRAC, which is what I do? And you do have to, you've got to have an, uh, an explanation of the cases of what a court held in a particular case of what a court held. So, so definitely, um, definitely do that. Um, um, otherwise it's, you're probably not gonna get, you're not gonna get a high score. You might still be able to pass, but I like, I think it's really doubtful if you don't do it at all. I like, it's probably not gonna get a 55 or probably gonna get no higher than a 55 is what I would say. Um, so, okay. Um, you've got to have counter arguments too. Um, counter arguments are critical. If you don't have counter arguments, you missed an issue and that that's critical. Um, somebody asked, why did I not pass? I don't, I can't answer that. Um, answer that. I'm just going through the questions here. Um, so how do we know if you need a rule explanation or what I call a rule proof or not? You know it, it's, it's just based on the simplicity of the issue. And you know it also too, if um, in this particular PT, I did do it for all three, but I'll talk about where you didn't necessarily, if I was gonna omit one because of time, I'll talk about which one I would have omitted. I would probably have omitted it on the second issue, probably, probably. And the reason I say that is because it just said you can, um, it's just because the rule is you can basically do anything to terminate it. Um, and the second issue, second issue, I feel like is so straightforward. So that's probably where I would have omitted a rule proof. Um, or maybe, maybe the first one, cause it's got, you've got the family code. So maybe, but I would, I, I do let, want to do them here. Um, uh, let me see. Um, The missing the analysis, somebody asked if, um, if missing the analysis on the third issue was enough of a reason to score low. Yeah, sadly it is. That's really what I saw is people that didn't pass the performance test got a 55. I, I don't think I saw a single score above. And I looked at, I don't know, probably like 200 um, PTs on this um, from this October test. And people that didn't, um, didn't get higher than usually than a 55 if they didn't go in depth in the third issue. So, um, so that was, that was massively, massively critical. Um, um, there will always, somebody asked, what if there are no counter arguments? Do you create one? No, there will be counter arguments to be made and we'll talk about them here. We'll talk about them here. Um, all right. So let's see. Let me just double check. Um, if you get it, if you get a performance test that has lots of factors, you don't necessarily have to discuss all of the factors separately. It honestly depends if the only, like in the Bomer v. Bomer performance test on that one, um, you did discuss all of the factors separately because that was really all you had to do for the most part. That was it. But there are other performance tests like Phoenix v. Biogenesis where there's like three issues and one of the issues has a six factor test. On that one, I wouldn't break apart the factors because you don't have time. So time permitting, like look to see what, what did the court do? What did the court do? Like in here on this one, um, and I'm gonna show you something with Laredo to take a cue from the court. Um, did they break up the factors and discuss them all separately? Yes or no? If they did, then you might wanna do that. If they didn't, then you can follow the format of how they analyze. So you can take cues from the cases, take cues from the cases. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Um, managing time being a man, you manage your time through practice. It's really through practice and identifying. So somebody asked, how do you manage your time to be able to finish the performance test? It's, it's knowing before you go in and spend all your time typing out analysis and typing out, like you notice, I haven't written in my rules and my rule proofs yet. And I know where the points are. So I know what I need to deal with quickly and get in and get out. So, and I know that I have about 45 minutes left to an, uh, a little bit more than that. Um, Cause I finished, I wrote my whole answer at the end. I did this whole process in about 80 minutes. So I I'm generally like, 
I don't expect you guys to be as fast as I am. Cause like for a variety of reasons, um, one of which is like, there's, I don't have the pressure on me that you guys have. Um, I think, and that's, I think a big deal, but if you had 10 more minutes than I did, I think you could do at least what I did. Um, so I, but I, I could tell, you know, where, where the points were and you, you want to know that. So at about 40 minutes, 30 some odd minutes, I knew where the points were. And then I went and I started typing and putting everything together. So, all right. Y'all ready to do some writing now then? Yes, I presume. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're going to write some rules and rule proofs. So the P in, in the ERPAC, the P is for a rule proof. A rule proof, what it is, you are explaining, you're explaining what, um, you're explaining the application of the law to, um, to a case, to a case. So what happened in the case in the library when they applied that rule to the facts of that case? That's you're proving up how the rule works. You're proving up how the rule works. Um, so we have R is your rules. We're gonna, and we're gonna type those in. So that's what I've got highlighted in pink. P is what I'm gonna use for my rule proof. I know what case I'm gonna use. And, and I'm, it's highlighted, so I'm gonna scroll. So if I'm going to Laredo, I'm like, okay, I look for my dark blue, where's Laredo? And then I say this, here's my rule. This is what I'm gonna use for my rule proof. And then the A is our analysis. C is if I have a counter argument, it's gonna go here. You always do your analysis, which is what you think the court, you like how you think it's gonna come out. And then if there is a counter argument on that issue, you do that in a separate paragraph. Next, your counter argument fails. It's not successful. And then your C here is your conclusion. It's your conclusion. Um, all right. All right, so now I wanna go back. I'm gonna start at the beginning. And this one's so nice because they're in order. So Miller v. Miller, so I have family code. I have the family code. Um, so I actually want to go to the family code and says here, um, it says here, so rule, gonna code Miller. Okay, so a minor, uh, actually, I'm just gonna type in this rule. So a contract otherwise valid entered into during minority may not be, um, disaffirmed um, on that ground if A, the contract, A, the reasonable value of things. I'm gonna leave typos in because it doesn't matter on the bar as long as it's legible. Unless I catch them as I'm typing and it bothers me. But generally perfection is the enemy of completion. And you've got to remember that everybody, perfection is the enemy of completion. Don't make your PT look beautiful and not finish it. So B, these things have been actually furnished to the minor or the minor's family. And C, the contract is entered into by the minor when not under the care of a parent or a guardian able to provide for the minor or the minor's family. I always, always, always underline um, anything I'm citing. I always underline it because it stands out more to the bar grader. Columbia uh, Family Code. section 6703. And then I want to scroll down to here. Um, if there's anything else, um, minor under care parents able to provide for them. They, uh, so minors, yeah, I may pay the reasonable value of things that service board and that of his family may not such, and may not such disaffirm such a contract. So, okay, so here, and I might just cite to Miller also. Miller really gives a more succinct version of this rule, but um, Miller gives a more succinct version of this rule, but it's essentially the same. And you, 
you don't have to also type this. You don't have to also type this. So I'm not going to actually. And then here, and I saw that there's a couple of things in the chat and questions. So let me just double check. So um, I'm gonna do the rule proof. I'm gonna do the rule proof. I'm gonna talk about the counter argument. Um, I'll, I'll get into that stuff next. So right now, the first thing we do is we do the rule. The first thing we do is do the rule. So the rule proof is different from the analysis. The rule proof is the analysis of the case in the library. The analysis here, this analysis is our analysis comparing our case to what happened in the case in the library and saying, what is the outcome gonna be? So for Miller, so what you do to write a rule proof is you say, is you follow the formula. You say in case name, the court held, and what did the court hold? What did the court hold regarding this issue in the case in the library? The court held, and what did they say? Um, the minor, uh, could, they could disaffirm the contract, right? The minor um, could disaffirm the contract because um, uh, the, I'm gonna say the, uh, the parent. So generally speaking, so actually, sorry, I skipped, let me give you the formula first. So in case name, the court held holding, and then you're going to state the holding. And what is the holding regarding the issue? What is the holding regarding here, just affirming the contract? The next issue, what is the holding, whether a letter or whether a parent or guardian effectively, effectively disaffirmed the contract for the minor? And on the third issue, was the principal, was the principal liable for the acts of the agent? So our rule proofs are going to deal with those. Yeah. Yeah, and you could talk about the necessary. Yeah, you would talk Karen, about, about the necessaries. So here, you're gonna say in whatever case, the court held, explain what it held, write what it held and why, and why? Because facts and reasoning. So what did it hold and why? So here, here in Miller, the court held that the minor could disaffirm the contract. The minor could disaffirm the contract because, because, the, um, because the parent, um, I will say the uh, funds were not used for um, necessaries as they were for, and I'm just, all I'm doing is I'm looking at what have I highlighted in blue? I'm looking at what have I highlighted? What is the court saying here? What is the court saying here? So in Miller, the court held the minor could disaffirm the contract because the funds were not used for necessary as they were for the, and then quotes here, this last line, the good things in life. In life. And I wanna look at the, the little elements here. So I wanna see, a contract otherwise valid um, entered into during minority may not be just affirmed on the ground that if the contract is to pay for the reasonable value of things necessary for the support of the minor or the minor's family, these things have been actually furnished to the minor or the minor's family. Uh, and C, the contract is entered into by the minor when not under the care of a parent or guardian able to provide for the minor or the minor's family. So what did it look like? So when when does that happen here it's not for necessity it's not for the necessaries of life if it's to provide for the good things of life right so that's what the court held here so if we look at what we have highlighted it says in entering judgment for josephine the trial court found that she had expended the twenty six thousand dollars she had received for herself and for bryce but that was insufficient to support the judgment the court did not find that josephine expended the money for herself and for bryce for things necessary for their support nor could they so have found. The evidence showed that at all relevant times, um, Josephine had an independent and substantial source of income. It also showed that she expended the $26,000 she had received as she herself admitted for the good things of life, not necessities. So because the funds were not used for necessaries as they were for the good things in life and at all relevant times, 
Josephine, I will say the, um, uh, the, no, not the minor, um, the really thing looking for, uh, the parent, well, the contracting party seeking to affirm. I like to generally take the terms and not use the actual names and from a case. I like to generalize them instead of so it'd be like agent principal instead of saying hand and Purcell because that gets confusing. So, but here it's a little tough uh, about um, seek. So here it's really like the minor and the, um, the person seeking to enforce the contract. So at all relevant times, the, the contracting party seeking to enforce um, had, um, or actually here, it's just, it's really just the parent here. The parent is trying to enforce. The parent had um, an independent and substantial source of income. That's it, really, that's all we need from this. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Are you sure? Yeah, okay. Okay, good, good, good. I'm sure that that makes total sense. So we're just explaining, we're just explaining, this tells us a rule, but what does that actually look like? What does that actually look like in, in reality? Okay, good. Good, good, good. Okay, so this is our formula and this is what it actually looks like when we insert the facts. And then that's it for this first case. Uh, that's it for this first case. Now I wanna go to the next case. And this is why I highlight is because now, now it's so much easier to be like, okay, where's my pink? Okay, then, and especially, I wanna show you all, what will it actually look like on exam day? What will it look like on exam day? It's gonna look like, this. Yeah. Give me one second. So on exam day, it's going to look like this. So when you have it just highlighted, and then you can just focus in on the part that you need, you can just focus in on the part that you need. It's a little bit easier. It's a little bit easier. Um, so here, if I go to the second issue and type it, um, type that, then it's going to make it. Um, it's gonna make it a little bit easier. So I'm gonna start typing in the rules from Brady. Generally speaking, generally speaking, um, if they state, if they actually state a statute in a case, it's generally gonna be written in a way that's a lot easier to understand. And we saw that with the last case. So here, I'm just gonna actually go straight to the rules in this case. So the rule, so as a general proposition, Parental consent is required for the provision of when you all are practicing, turn spell check off. When you're practicing, turn spell check off because it's so it's so um, distracting. So I turn it off and I'll catch stuff, but it's a lot easier without having the squigglies. Um, so just mind for the simple reason that minors may disaffirm their own contracts to acquire such services. Okay, and this is, what case is this, Brady? I think it's generally, so somebody asked if it's best to write the rule as stated in the, in the statute or to take the rule from the case. I generally think that if you take the rule from the case, it's gonna be written in a way that's a lot easier to comprehend. So I, you can really, you can do either. I think if you pull it from the case, it's easier. Um, the only thing you gotta be careful of is that it's the same rule, that it's the same rule, that nothing's been overruled. I've seen that happen before, um, but it was pretty obvious that it was overruled um, when you looked at the statute, that the statute overruled the case. So just double check for that. So uh, I also, I never write, according to Columbia Family Code, blah, blah, blah. I just actually write the rule and then cite to the code section afterward. And, and this is true in practice too. A minor may make a contract in the same manner as an adult subject to the power of disaffirmance. Provided um, in... The 
section 6702. Oh, no, this is Brady. This one is like family code, and then I keep thinking of Brady Bunch. Um, and then um, simply stated, one who provides a minor with services does so at her own risk. One, uh, there's a couple of good questions. I'm going to get to those in a second. One who provides a minor with services does so at her own risk. When, whenever there's like a good little, like I like that the, this little like does so at their own risk. I like that language. So I will often actually put that in quotes to, to grab the grader's attention, whoever's reading my PT. So I want to grab, um, I want to grab it, uh, exactly. Um, and I'll put it in quotes. Yeah, I will do the counter arguments too. So let me look at some of these questions. So, um, I put the quotes generally speaking, and I didn't mention this earlier, a bar grader spends just a few minutes reading a performance test, not very long, two to three minutes. Um, and, and it actually, like I'm, I've done enough grading of stuff. Um, not like when I'm grading actually for like my bar applicants, um, like professionally, I, I spend a lot of time grading, but, um, when I'm grading, uh, and for my, all my law students and other students too. Um, but generally speaking, you can go through and you can, you can actually look when you're really intimately familiar with a particular, um, essay, you can grade it really quickly and be fairly precise about it. Um, not to say that they always are, because I've seen some of like absolute atrocities in grading from bar examiners and like massive score differences that I just completely disagree with. Um, but it, it is actually, they can read them pretty quickly and see whether or not you got it. Um, and your job, your job on the bar is to make it so that they can see everything you do really well, easily. So you want to make it stand out. So like headings are your friends. This is why I split stuff up in paragraphs. It's in into different paragraphs. This is why I underline the cases. I want to make it stand out to them that they can say I used Brady where I was supposed to use Brady. That I saw that like you enter at your own risk, you know, and that that is from Brady. That I use Columbia Family Code section sixty seven oh two. Like that I'm using these things. So you want to make it really really easy for them. Um. Um. Okay. So. Uh, those, these are most of the questions I've answered. If you take a rule from the case, do you need to repeat it from the statute? No, no, if you, but if there is a, if you are given a statute, if you're given a statute and it's stated in the case, just for like citation principles, cite the statute first and then cite the case because just from blue booking, that's the order of authority. Like you don't have to blue book, but like, just remember that the cases are more important or that statutes are more important than cases. So just follow that. That's the one thing I say about it. Um, the relevant statutes are not always used in the cases, but when you have a lot of statutes, when you have a lot of statutes, they are. Um, when you have a lot of statutes, um, they will tell you, like basically they'll tell you which ones are more important and they'll, they'll decide, they'll break them apart. They're not always though, like if there's just one statute, it's not always gonna be discussed in the cases. So it, that varies. So it really, usually when there's a lot of statutes, they're gonna be discussed in the cases. And that tells you how to discern what's important from what's not. You're not gonna always, you're not gonna use every statute. Like there's a couple in here from the family code that I don't use, I think. I'm ready to change them. Um, you don't have to worry about plagiarism. Like don't worry about any of that. Um, and I'm gonna show you the case analysis and counter arguments. I am gonna do some of that, yes. Um, if you are using policy, it does go in your rule statement. It does go in your rule. So if that's, I use policy often to like bump up to a higher score. So I wanna make sure that, cause it's generally a bootstrapping argument to like make it better, um, to make something better. Um, so um, yes, somebody said, yeah, I didn't cite the statutes here. So I took the language from the case, that's true. Uh, but generally speaking, I do, and I'll do that in other places. Um, it's somebody said they wrote the risk rule in the first issue uh that they wrote the risk rule in the first issue that's fine it's okay as long as you get it in there that's fine you're not losing points just for not doing the like citation of the case or of the statute and then the case um somebody asked whether you can use statutes on a standalone basis yeah yeah you 
You absolutely can. Uh, you don't use it only when they are used in a case. Sometimes you will just use the statute as a standalone. And there are, um, that's often like, if you, that's often where you're not gonna obviously have a rule proof. If you have a really simple issue, um, if you have a really simple issue, um, then you do that. Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, I'm gonna go back to doing a side by side, but I wanted to show you when it's top and bottom and how the highlighting helps you with that because then your eyes are just drawn there and it, it makes it a bit easier. Um, all right, here, let me just finish typing out the rules here. So a minor make a contract, you do so at their own risk. Um, and also no specific language is required to communicate an intent to disaffirm minor's contract. Uh, a minor's contract may be avoided by any act or word disclosing an unequivocal intent. An intent to repudiate its binding force and effect. Okay, do you all want to, I want you all to draft a rule proof here. Like it's, this is like the simplest, simplest one. So draft it really quickly and, and message it to me in the chat. Oh, let me look at the Q&A question. Um, all right, so I'm gonna put these back to side by side. Put these back to side by side. And then let's, let's talk about Laredo. Let's talk about Laredo. So, um, so in Laredo, in Laredo, what happened, um, we have, we have quite a few rules here. We have quite a few rules here. And I'm just going to go actually show you, this is my final version down here. This is my rule proofs that I wrote, although it needs to restart the numbering. I'll fix that. Okay. Um, so let's talk about Laredo. So Laredo is, is a bit more, there's a bit more in here. And there's, there's a couple of things. So when I started typing, oh, let me look at the Q and A's really quickly. Um, uh, all right. So, so when I started typing, I realized like this section is massive. This section is massive. And it's really talking about two different concepts. It's talking about actual authority and apparent authority. In Laredo, they talk about both. It was each side made an argument. One side argued that there was actual authority. The other one argued that there was apparent authority. Um, or one side said there was no actual authority, thus no authority at all. And the other one was like, no, no, there's this whole other thing called apparent authority, which is correct. Um, but they give you the statutes for both actual and apparent. So because of that, I split up the issues and I actually split up C, the, the third issue, into both, you know, did he have actual authority? Did he have apparent authority? Um, um, and we know that we know that Ryan lacked actual authority. We know that Ryan lacked actual authority. So that's pretty easy. That's pretty easy. So you could do that. You could do that. And in the end, I did end up doing that, but it wasn't, it's not required. It's certainly not required. Um, it's definitely not required. So, but here I just start type, I put, I start putting in my rules, right? And I, I just have the rules from the civil code that I pulled from here. Um, and I just type them verbatim. I just type them verbatim um, uh, for actual authority and apparent authority. So Columbia Civil Code 3801 is just pretty much verbatim and 3803, which are the two regarding actual authority. And then I had a parent authority. I have a parent authority. So here, um, here, and I cite to, I, I uh, for the apparent authority, I cite to Laredo as well. So this is an example of what it would look like to do your site with the code and then with um, the case. And then I have here, it's a much longer rule proof. So I'm not gonna tell you all to write this one, but just like you just did the other one, just like you just did that one, you would do the same thing here. Here, the point is there are so many facts to show that there was apparent authority. There are all of these facts. Ours don't have it, right? So we're gonna think with 
we're gonna have to distinguish from that. Um, we're gonna have to distinguish from that. So, but I literally, just like you all just did, I just did the same thing with Laredo for my rule proof. I just did the same thing with the rate from Laredo, but it's, I just took a lot of this. I just took a lot of this. And I just said in Laredo, right in case name, the court held. And then what did they hold? Our principal was liable on a contract and that apparent authority existed where apparent authority existed. So I, so here, remember that the court held and here is, are you liable on for the, for the charge, are you liable? Is the principal liable? And I just added that apparent authority existed where facts. And I just listed all of these facts and that's it. So it's the same concept, literally. It's just that it's longer. So in Laredo, the court held a principal was liable on a contract and that apparent authority existed where the agent had over many years entered into contracts of sale as well as contracts of consignment for the principal within Columbia, blah, blah, blah. And I just put all, I just literally almost verbatim took the facts from the case and plopped them in here and plopped them in here. So it's the same concept, it's the same concept, but you see this is starting to look like a lot bigger of an issue. And if you look at the selected answers, theirs look like this, theirs look like this. So we take the cues that we get from the cases on how in depth did they go on to each of the issues? And, and we mirror that, we mirror that. All right, now I wanna go dig into the file a little bit and talk about writing our analysis and drafting counter arguments. So I'm gonna talk about that. I know that we're like gonna hit three hours pretty quick here, um, but I just wanna talk about that. Shouldn't take too long and then I'll answer questions. Then I'll answer questions. So, um, so, after we've gone through now, now the good thing is I'm now done with the library. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to look at it anymore. Now I want to go to the file. Now I want to go to the file. And it's thankfully not very big. It's thankfully not very big. So the first issue is really straightforward. Um, it, the first issue is really straightforward. Um, we just know that, you know, that these aren't for the necessaries of life. So I would just say, you know, um, I know that it's for video games um, and that video games, I would say, qualify as a good thing in life. They're not necessaries. Like my nephew would probably say that they are, but they're not. He's 10. Um, well, although my like 38 year old brother, I think also thinks that they are, um, but they're not. Right. So analogize to that. So I would just say um, similar to. So when you're writing your analysis, you're always comparing the facts of our case to the case in the library, to the case in the library. So just as the, um, you could say just as or similar to, so do you, you know, pick your poison, whichever one you want. Um, but I'm gonna say just as the um, purchases in Miller, were for the good things in life. Um, Ryan's purchases were also for the good things in life because people, because Ryan was buying extra, well, he was buying extra lives and, um, extra weapons and video games and video games games uh, are not necessary for um, Ryan's support or to support Ryan's family. Something like that, just really straightforward and easy, just so something like that. So it's really similar. So I'm just making a comparison. I'm just making a quick comparison. And I would say thus, um, thus just as the miner in Miller was able to disaffirm the contract, Ryan will also be able to disaffirm the contract. 
In my conclusions, I like to also analogize to the cases and be like, so just like that conclusion. So because the facts are identical, um, that means that conclusion will be the same. So I like to mirror that. You could also, if you want to just like be out of there quickly, you could also just say thus, Ryan will be able to disaffirm the contract. You could also just do that. You can also just do that. So that's pretty straightforward, simple issue. I, I saw a lot of PTs from October though, where people spent, they like went really in depth here. They went really in depth here. And if you did that, then you, you know, you, you didn't have time to finish the third issue and go in depth there. And that, that was a problem. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about whether Janice's letter disaffirmed the contract for Ryan. Um, so here, let's look at the letter. Um, let's look at the letter. The letter here, says, I'm writing to request that you reverse the amount of $8,980 for unauthorized charges. Um, so I'm going to say here, um, I'm going to say, uh, my understanding may be avoided by activists with an unequivocal intent to repudiate its binding force and effect. I think that this could be viewed as not unequivocal. I think it could be looked at as equivocating a bit. So you could say, but, but I'm gonna argue, I'm gonna say it essentially was. I'm gonna say just as the parents letter in Brady uh, effectively disaffirmed a contract, the minor's contract, um, uh, Janice's letter um, disaffirmed Ryan's contract because Janice wrote to Gamer Tracks and informed it that the uh, additional eight thousand nine hundred eighty, not eighty nine thousand, that'd be a lot. That the additional eight thousand nine hundred eighty dollars um, uh, were unauthorized and. Uh, that they were unauthorized and um, da, 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 and requested the charges be reversed. In effect, terminating the contract. So, okay, so there's a, there's, let's talk about counter arguments because I want to do it here first before we look at the third issue. That's a lot more complicated. So let's do it on a simpler issue. So, Essentially, what you have to do is say, okay, there's a bad fact here. There's a bad fact here. This issue could go the other way. And I think it's because it's not, she's not writing and informing them that she's terminating the contract. She's requesting that they reverse the fee. She's requesting it. So it's not as forceful. So I'm going to point that out. So although the Janice's request um, to reverse the charges is not as forceful as the letter in Brady because the letter in Brady um, informed the creditor it was terminating the contract and Janice's letter requested to terminate the contract. Um, this does not uh, render Janice's, I'm gonna say not said this is not. Janice's letter still effectively disaffirmed. And you have to come up with a reason because, and I'm gonna tie in the language from the rule because uh, a, and I'm going to say because per Brady, a minor's uh, contract may be avoided by any act or word disclosing an unequivocal intent to repudiate the contracts binding force and effect. So you're essentially for a counter argument. So what we just did there is we identified the bad thing. We identified the, what is the counter argument. And then we say, why is it bad? Why is it bad? So here, this isn't as factually 
factually, it's, I don't think it's as severe as what's in Brady. And maybe, and, and the question is, does it have to be that severe? And my argument is no, it doesn't because of the rule. So we say, although bad fact, bad fact, um, which suggests, you know, that maybe it's not, not going to just affirm this is unpersuasive because and explain why. Um, so although Janet, so although bad fact, so although Janice's request to reverse the charges is not as forceful as the letter in Brady, because the letter in Brady informed the creditor it was terminating the contract. And Janice's letter requested a term, um, it, it informed it wasn't terminating. And you might, I hate usually doing italicized italics, but informed the creditor was terminating and Janice's letter requested. So I might emphasize the difference between an informing and requesting. Um, you have to give a reason why that's going to be a bad argument. Um, and I, so I say Janice's letter still effectively disaffirmed because, and I tie in the rule, per Brady, a minor's contract may be avoided by any actor word. So do you guys see the counter argument, how we deal with that here? Does that make sense? Caroline, okay, good. I just wanna see some yeses here. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, good. Gucci, let me email you. Okay, good, Rock, Roxy. I got a heck yes from Roxy, thank you very much. Okay, cool, perfect. Um, okay, now, now all of that, being said, all of that being said, now this is a simpler issue, right? Um, and and correct counter. So you're not going to have counter arguments for every issue. You will have counter arguments in every PT, but you're not going to have a counter argument for every issue for every case. Uh, but you will. You have to have counter arguments. You also in every single and for California, not for the UBE, um, but for California and. Since they switched to the 90 minute performance test in July, 2017, you have been required to distinguish at least once. So to distinguish from a case that I've seen on every single performance test. So be sure that you know how to do that. It's more challenging than analogizing. Analogizing to is saying, showing where they're similar. Distinguishing is saying that this case is not like this other case. This case is not like this other case. So if we look at the last issue, if we look at the last issue, it's just, it's not the same. It's, it, it's, it's um, it could go either way, particularly, particularly because, and I really think that she's not gonna be liable for the fee, for the charge, um, but in the selected answers, they came out both ways and they were both high scoring passing. So it could come out, you could say that she was liable. You could also say that she wasn't. I really think that she's not going to be. I really think she's not going to be. Um, but the problem is really all in this, is in this one sentence on the left here. Um, um, somebody asked, distinguish, do you distinguish once generally or is there something specific they're urging you to notice? Here, I think you really had to distinguish from Laredo. Like here, there wasn't anything else. Like the other cases, it's similar. Here, the outcome is different from what I, in, in the case in the library, from what I think the outcome in our case will be. And in every single of the California 90 minute PTs, you've had to do that. It's, there's been a case where you have to distinguish, say our facts are different from the case, thus the opposite conclusion that was reached in the case in the library, we will get the opposite conclusion from that. So you, you do have to do that. Um, okay. So gamer, so here, here, let's just talk about this a little bit. There's a counter argument. So gamer tracks contacted Janice. So Laredo, in, in Laredo, there is all of this stuff. There is all of this, these facts that demonstrate that there was apparent authority. There was no express authority. That's pretty easy and that's pretty clear. But there was, a, I think in, in Laredo, there was apparent authority. Here, I don't think that there was. So why, why? So. Um, it has to be, per the rule, you have to, um, the third party entering into the contract for apparent authority had to reasonably believe that the agent had the authority to act. And here, I just don't think so. I don't think 
that um, gamer tracks once contacting Janice and verifying that she had given Ryan permission to use the card is valid for every single purchase going forward. I don't, I just don't think that that can, I don't think that that is reasonable, particularly given that these are video games, that this is a video game that's minors playing video games, buying extra lives. There's also facts in here that show that it wasn't, Ryan didn't even realize that he was buying more stuff. He thought it was all included. He thought it was all included. So it's not obvious. So given the non-obvious nature of these charges, it seems as though gamer tracks could not reasonably believe um, that I, I don't, and at least in my opinion, in my opinion, I don't think, but, but you could go both ways and people do come to both conclusions and pass. So that didn't matter. What mattered was going into depth. What mattered was going into depth. So when it came down to it, this is what it looked like at the end. I had actual authority and actual authority I had my rules. I did not do a rule proof on actual authority because they didn't discuss really whether there was actual authority. So here's an example of just get in and out of actual authority and then spending all the time on apparent authority. So I just have that huge rule proof of Laredo. I say here, like the principle in Laredo and I go into it, this is my analysis. Oh, there's, although there's an incomplete sentence, which I'll fix. Um, and then here's my counter argument. Although the contract that Ryan signed stated that he was not authorized, like there's all these bad facts. It stated that he was authorized to use the credit or debit card as the agent, that he was authorized to use the card up to and including the limit established by, uh, um, by the issuer. And they had reviewed the service terms of service with his parents. Anybody that is that is entering into a contract with the minor, like I have to think, like a kid playing video game, he's gonna be like, sure, right? Kids, like that's part of the reason they can disaffirm. That's part of the reason they can disaffirm. So here, um, here, um, it's uh, it's just gamer tracks knowing it was dealing with a child knowing video games are often played by children who may not fully comprehend they're spending money or even entering into a contract. They couldn't believe that Ryan had the authority to spend an additional near $9,000 on video games, on video games. Um, so, and, and, you know, perhaps had they on every instance checked, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? Then that would be different. That would amount to, um, yes, the counter arguments under apparent authority, the counter argument is under apparent authority, but, you know, if they had done it each and every time, then it would look more like Laredo. But Laredo, you had this and you had that, like all of these different things. And I, I used that. I said, you know, perhaps had Janice approved each purchase, purchase, actually signed off on allowing Ryan to spend up to the limit on the credit card when Gamer Tracks contacted her. Um, if Ryan had something akin to a truck that said agent for Purcell, because that's what they had, you know, in the Laredo case then maybe the belief of gamer tracks could be viewed as reasonable. But absent all that evidence that we had in Laredo, um, and this should say Laredo, not Purcell, the, the belief cannot be said to be reasonable. I'm gonna fix up some of these typos. Um, and I say, according to Janice is not liable for the charge. And that's it. We have like 15 minutes left. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, so let me go through and answer some of these Q&A questions. Let me go through and answer some of these Q&A questions. Um, okay. Um, so somebody asked, what do you do when you pull out a few rules and it applies to two of the questions? You can use rules multiple places. That's totally fine. It's totally fine. Um, you can also say C rule above, C rule regarding X above. You can do that a little bit. I, the only time I do copy and paste is sometimes like if I do have a rule that I'm going to use in multiple places and it's long, I'll copy paste, but like that can lead to mistakes and I don't like to do it, but just be careful if you do do that. Um, all right. So I talked about counter arguments. It is okay to abbreviate the rule. Um, just do it as a, in a way that makes the most sense and that you think is clear. Make sure that you clearly convey it and make sure that you appropriately cite to the rule for that. Um, how important is it to cite to authority? I think it's incredibly important. I think it's incredibly important. Notice also, I don't use id. 
I don't use id because it might change. So I don't use id. I just actually cite um, to what I want. Um, I also I also don't use a lot of pronouns. I use proper names. I'm going to say Janice and Ryan because you'll get confused. If you start saying he and she and they, and then you try to go back, you're going to have to go back and figure out what you were trying to say. So use, use proper pronouns or use proper like names, don't use pronouns. Um, you use the same format for persuasive essays, except that like you use the same, the same format, but the headings are persuasive rather than objective like they are here. Um, and um, I suggest addressing the issues in order. I, I always suggest addressing the issues in order, go in order, allocate time. So here, if I was like, if I had like 45 minutes ish left to type and like do like read the file and do my writing, um, I would have probably spent like five minutes doing the analysis of the first one, five minutes on the analysis, maybe that maybe a little bit longer on the second one, because it's just the analysis. I've already written my rules and my rule proofs. Those are written. So if I just do, you know, these little paragraphs like I did up here, it's not very long. Like this isn't, I can do this. I can write this in five minutes quickly once I've gone through the file. So that doesn't take long. This I might take, you know, a little bit longer, a little longer than five minutes. Um, and the last one, the other one is probably like five, eight minutes. This last one is probably gonna be like 20 minutes. So it's gonna be about twice as the others. Um, the bar, somebody asked um, whether the bar allows you to highlight in different colors. Yes, they do. That's why I use the different colors is because they do. Um, um, I, again, I, I always answer the questions in order. I always, cause you've got to answer all of them. To me, it gets confusing to remember like, what have I done? What have I not done? So I answer the, the everything in order. All model answers don't have a minimum score. Um, there's it, the score that is, um, it's, I could go into it, but the answer is no. Um, of the, all the model answers, they're generally the, the people that are um, selected for the selected answers. Um, and they're not modeled or selected because they're definitely not perfect. Um, but the ones that are selected, they, it, they were taking the bar on either their first or second try, not beyond that. Um, and they, they did well on that essay and they passed the bar overall. So, but it varies. It depends on who's in charge of admissions of the bar. They like, it varies. It varies um, the scores depending on like the people, the graders. Um, um, somebody asked if you can summarize rule statements. I generally like to keep rule statements very precise because bar graders and calibration sessions, they will pick apart people that, that aren't precise. Like if you say the wrong fact, if you don't characterize it properly, like I just try to like, just use the exact language because it's going to generally be better in the long run. Um, somebody said that there are templates that tell you to write the headings in IRAC. I don't know what that means exactly. I mean, I know what IREC is obviously, but just write like simple headings is good. You don't have to do like a crazy heading. Um, you, in following the process, in following the process, you draft your rules and your rule proofs and you do all of them. And then you go and you read the library and then you draft your analysis. So you don't draft rules and rule proofs and then do analysis. You draft your rules and your rule proofs for everything and then you go back, you read the file, and then you write your analysis section by section. Um, and yeah, I think that's my transition of my, I started with the skeletal and it transitions into the final. I do not use scratch paper or anything. Um, yeah. All right, cool. And if you signed up for the course, if you signed up, then um, if you signed up uh, for the thing, you'll get the answer. You'll get the answer. So. Um, uh, somebody wants to talk to me. Yeah, I can hang out afterwards once I'm done recording. I don't know who that is. It just says Galaxy S9. Yeah, that's fine. Um, what type of words make something persuasive different from objective? Um, and yes, um, somebody asked um, what you do if, so on this one, um, what you do to make them uh, a heading persuasive is you incorporate, it's a conclusion. Basically, you're just stating a conclusion with facts and law. So for the first issue, if we were to um, if we were to put this, take this and make it persuasive, we would just say Ryan can disaffirm the contract because 
it was not for the necessaries of life. That's it. Uh, um, word count. Um, Starla, let me, uh, oh yeah, and Roxy, yeah, 16 and 65. Yeah, let me, so let me explain that. I'll do that in a second. Word count's not really all that important. Generally speaking, if you're like above 1,200 words, 1,000 words, 1,200 words, you can get a passing answer. There's not a magic number. Mine tend to be 1,400, 1,500, 1,600, but I write, the way that I write is a lot more precise than a lot of people. So that's like just, the, it, that's a style thing. So mine tend to be a little bit shorter, but really dense. Um, I've seen people get really high scores and then be 800, 900, a thousand words. So it, there's not a magic number. Um, there's not a magic number. Um, Starla, they're going to be in the PT, in the PT, you're going to have them top and bottom, top and bottom. Um, the, the answer, the answer is on the bottom and then the top has the fact pattern. Email me if, if you have a question though, Starla, email me. Um, I use this, um, during the analysis, what words make something more persuasive versus objective? Um, it's honestly, I don't really do it that differently. Um, when it's persuasive, I'll say somebody failed to do this. Um, I will really point out the flaws in an opposing side's arguments. Um, so it, it's really, honestly, it's not a whole lot different. Uh, it's for me because I think, yeah. Um, and, but I do, um, I have another video where I go into a persuasive one. The first one that I did, which was from like July of 2020, was posted to YouTube. Um, and it'll be posted, I think in this, um, in the course, if you signed up for it, like with all the free stuff, um, it'll be in there. And I would watch that because it's, I go over a persuasive one. Um, yeah, Starla, it's the same as last time. Yep. So a 60 to a 65, a 60 to a 65, this is a really good question. Um, it's generally speaking, it's the depth. It's a depth of analysis. So like a 60, um, a 60 would not have had this, this counter argument here. A 60 would not have had this counter argument in the second issue. A 60 probably like would have would have just dealt with the third issue a little bit more shallowly. So it wouldn't have gone as in depth into Laredo and it would not have gone as in depth with all this massive counter argument. So you'll have a counter argument, but it's just gonna be shorter. You know, it might just be something like, you know, unlike in Laredo where there were numerous facts and ways that the principal expressed apparent authority to third parties, no such facts existed here. That might be a 60. So seeing it, but not explaining in depth why. Not explaining in depth why. Um, not explaining it in depth why. So um, Roxy, that's that's the difference. And you're, a, okay, so a passing score now that the cut score is lowered, a passing score for the October bar was a 59.117. They go in five point increments unless you get a second read and then you can get like a, a halfway, but you don't ever wanna do that. Um, but they go, I say always shoot for at least a 65 or higher on the PT. Um, I, I say always shoot for that. Yes, the, uh, this, I'm gonna, this all that I, my, my work from tonight will be posted. Um, but you should absolutely shoot for 65. A 60 may pass, a 60 may be passing, but just because it was in October, doesn't mean that it will be for February because it changes based on the scaling. So it could be that a 60 is like a better score um, than it was in October, but it could like, because it could be that the passing score is like a 58 point something in February, whereas it was a 59.117 in October. Um, but it could be that it's like a 60.1 that you need. So, and that's for each written event. So the five essays and the PT, which counts as double. So always shoot for at least a 65, always shoot for at least a 65. So identify where are the counter arguments, identify where do I wanna go in depth, know that going into it. So you really wanna have a game plan. Um, um, how do you incorporate policy to boost your score? You bring that into, you bring that into, I often incorporate it into my counter arguments. That's where I bring it in. 
So in this one, um, in this one, I would have used it um, in, in probably in Laredo, I would have used the policy as well. And that would have pushed us up. And that also like, that's how you get above a 65. Um, uh, how do you score well when you handwrite? You just plan out your answer. You just plan out your answer. If you're handwriting it, I'm assuming that you've got, that you have experience. Um, you, I'm assuming that you have experience handwriting exams. And so um, you wanna really plan out your answer. What I would say you can do is if you're doing it in blue books, if there's three issues, do it in three blue books and then just like cross out the excess pages. So that way you can go in order, like you can do the rule and then you can do your rule proof and then you can do your analysis and follow this method. So, but you just gotta have a plan when you're handwriting. Um, yes, this will be available. I think mine would have probably scored like a 75-ish, somewhere at like 80. You know, I, I did this time, I did this time. So something like that. Um, and I had, I had extra time and I didn't wanna like go nuts on it. So yeah, I think it's pretty high scoring. Uh, when you use this, you use the same method for every type of performance test out there. Um, and yeah, using the uh, yeah, facts to anal analyze, I mean, so somebody asked if using, using the facts to analyze earns more points. I mean, yeah, you've got to use all, you know, using more facts from the file is going to get you more points too, but you've got to balance that by answering all of the issues. So don't do, don't do all the facts and all the stuff in issue one and not go in depth on issue three. So you have to know where, where to do that. All right. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. <laughs> Cat, no. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, uh, we'll probably send you all a survey uh, just to like get feedback on like, you know, what else might you guys want to see if I were to do more stuff in the future or if like, I don't know, um, telling me where you went to law school is helpful because then I can reach out to law schools. Um, if you all feel like giving me like a little review on Yelp, that's cool, but totally don't have to. Um, and if you need anything, you know, shoot me an email. Um, you can email at hello at bar-md.com. Um, yeah. And just, you know, spread the word because I appreciate that most of all. Um, and I do have, um, I do have, I do have courses for this stuff, but, um, yeah, so there's lots. Um, cool. Thank you so much um, for staying and sticking it out. I know it's a long session, um, but have, you know, really good, uh, really good luck on the test. Um, if you all have any other questions, like I think most of you found me on the Facebook group. I'm in there like a lot. And if you have a question, you can tag me in it. But um, yeah, just best of luck. Keep studying. You all can do this. It's um, you all can do this. So cool. <laughs>